I want to welcome everybody to the second of a series of uh, discussions about the right to be forgotten. And um, this is a, a meeting of an advisory council that Google has asked to be formed. Uh, and my name is Eric Schmidt. What we're working hard to comply with the ruling that was handled down, handed down by the uh, European Court of Justice in May which requires us to in evaluate individual requests to remove information in search results about a person. But there are complicated issues at stake in the request that we're receiving, and we need to balance the right, because of course the, ch the court said we had to make these decisions, we need to balance the right of information against an individual's right to privacy. We've convened this council of experts that you see to my left and right to advise us on how to do that. Um, what we're going to do is we have, and I'll introduce them as we go along, eight really interesting experts who will give a short discussion of their view on some of these issues, and we want to make sure that we reserve as much time for questions and answers initially from the panel and the experts, and then also involving our audience. Um, because David and I are, and David, I'll introduce David in a second, are from Google, we will not be saying very much. We're listening and we're primarily here to make sure that the conversation occurs between the experts and the panel, and the panel itself will deliberate on its own in many different ways. So, so now that I've talked about the panel, let me introduce them. Um, Luciano is uh, to my right, Luciano Floridi, professor of information ethics at Oxford University. As a secret, he grew up near here. Um, Sylvie Kaufman, who's an editor in the French newspaper Le Monde. Fl Frank LaRue, uh, over on the right, former UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to, be, to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. To my right, Jose Luis Pinar, former Spanish uh, DPA and professor at the University CEU of San Pablo. Um, to my left, let's see, we, a number of people, Sabine, uh, Lloyd Hasser Schnarrenberger, former federal minister of justice in Germany. Uh, Peggy Valky, right, uh, professor of law at the University of, is it Leuven? Um, Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia, someone many of you know. And David Drummond, to my immediate left, who is the senior vice president of Google and runs, runs many, many important parts of Google. Uh, our tenth member, whose name is Lydia Kolukasuk. Um, is unable to be with us in Rome, but she is participating in the video online and she'll participate in future events as well. Um, on my left, we have a number of experts, uh, Mr. Guido Scorza, uh, Gianni Rotti, uh, Alessandro Montalero, uh, Oreste Policino, uh, and on my right, we have Professor Vincenzo Zeno, uh, let's see, Zeno Zen Zenkovic, Mr. Elio Catania, Mrs. Lorella Zanardo, Mr. Massimo Russo, and we're looking forward to their comments. We're going to do this in English with presentations in Italian. Make sure that you're wearing a headset. Um, and we're also streaming this entire procedure live to Google Video, and many people around the world are watching as we do this. Uh, what we're going to do is run for roughly an hour, take a break. Then we're going to have a short break to the bathroom and, uh, and get a snack and so forth. Then we'll have another, uh, another group of four. And then, as time permits, we're going to encourage audience Q&A from you all to our panel and to our experts, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, make sure from, from the questions, we'll give you cards. Make sure you write your questions in the cards, because that's the best way to get your question asked. So I think, Mr. Mr. Guido Scorza, are you ready, are you ready to be first? So um, Guido graduated Maxa Cum Laude from the University of Rome. He's an attorney of law and professor of IT law at the University of Bologna. As a boy, I lived in Bologna, by the way, so I love Bologna. Um, he regularly holds seminars and, and workshops uh, for public institutions and private companies. He's the president of the Instituto per uh, Politique de la Innovazione, uh, and a correspondent for a range of journals and magazines, including Wired, L'Espresso, Fatto Quotidiano, uh, Computer Business Review, Internet Magazine. He's also published widely in national, international law reviews on many of these subjects. So again, uh, let's set a 10-minute goal, Lido. Please go ahead. Yeah. Many thanks. Um, 
prima di rispondere ad alcune delle domande che ci avete anticipato in preparazione di questo incontro, permettetemi qualche considerazione che riflette il mio modo di guardare a questo problema di forgetfulness e della memoria collettiva from the of the web especially from a different angle different uh, from uh, the simple application of uh, the rules uh, of uh, the law and force which i believe is inappropriate to regulate this phenomenon now uh, please forgive me if i'll be uh, having some uh, personal views now let me make my first consideration uh, the innovations obviously always have been the hallmark of history and have been marking history and they changed the way of living of people and of society this happened uh, with fire with the wheel with the press uh, uh, with the telegraph uh, with uh, electric energy and this is also happening uh, now again and now governments have the task of governing changes and now I'm not truly convinced that the best of the ways uh, to perform this task is the one of doing so by looking for answers and solutions uh, uh, when considering principles uh, of uh, law and of rules that belong to pastimes because we're running the risk of uh, slowing down changes uh, or hampering changes uh, prior um, to having obtained an ethical judgment as to those circumstances whereby that change is uh, going to be a good thing or a bad thing uh, and to be hoped for for the entire society. Then there is a second principle which I would like to share with you. Uh, the right to be forgotten is something which is uh, logically opposed to the right to have history. The more we expand uh, the right to be forgotten, the more we can press history. So I believe that it is more than appropriate uh, during this talk uh, to put at the center of this table the definition of what history is. Erodoto Diedi Carnasso, the father of all of the historians, uh, has always been writing that history was never made only of the deeds of famous people and heroes, the, pub the so-called public uh, characters and figures, uh, but also of human events. Uh, now, this is the exposure of the re research of Herodotus, of Carnassus, uh, because uh, human events uh, should never fade with time, uh, and that the wonderful uh, great deeds that were made by barbarians and by Greeks uh, should be never forgotten. The human uh, deeds, uh, the one of common people, but also those wonderful deeds of heroes and famous figures, uh, the ones that we would nowadays term uh, public figures. Uh, so all this falls into the same uh, chapter, which is known as history. Now, then there is a third consideration I would like to share with you, whereby the today's uh, uh, facts and events will turn into tomorrow's uh, history. Now, the, cron the, 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 the events of today are the tesseres of the mosaic uh, that the historian is uh, called to make up and to compose in order to narrate a historical period uh, or a given story. I don't believe uh, that uh, events uh, or chronicle events uh, may have a deadline. Uh, and if we do so, if we allow for such a deadline, we are compromising the possibility that historians have to narrate history. Then there is another consideration uh, which I would like to present to you. The indexation services and the research services, I believe, are one and part of all of the services provided to the information society. They belong to new dynamics uh, of circulation of information. Those who produce nowadays uh, and publish uh, the online content, especially if it's a professional in the IT sector, does so with the full awareness and with the full expectation and legitimate expectation that that information will be made accessible through infrastructures, uh, IT infrastructures, and according to the dynamics that are typical of that infrastructure. And I believe that the freedom of expression which we exercise uh, online is not having only regard to the content, but also with the modalities through which uh, the publisher, the blogger, the journalist, the user of a platform of a journal, journalistic content, uh, uh, decides to publish and to uh, disseminate uh, content. Uh, so delisting, de-indexing a context means that we are altering ex post uh, all of the accessibility dynamics to that given content, uh, thus marking in a significant manner uh, and affecting in a significant manner the information uh, right. Uh, uh, and in the case uh, this should happen, we will be modifying uh, that information. Now, delisting and de-indexing such a content means that we are 
ripping away from uh, a book, uh, the book uh, of history, a number of pages. So we are intervening on a specific choice, which was the one of the publisher and of the author. Now let me try an answer to some of the questions that were asked. Uh, the first one. Who can ask the de-indexation uh, of a given piece of information uh, to protect its own privacy? Well, I believe uh, that this uh, should never be dealt with uh, from the viewpoint of uh, subjective uh, qualities of uh, the person uh, requesting that, uh, whether it be a public person or uh, not. Uh, what is important is to consider public facts uh, as opposed to the ones that are not uh, of any importance to the public. Uh, there are public uh, figures uh, and their own uh, facts uh, that are having no interest for the public. Uh, and then there are common places which instead are very interesting to the public. Uh, and then there are other hypotheses where common figures uh, turn into public figures uh, Mm, and uh, because uh, they may be involved in interesting facts to the public. Uh, now, another aspect has got to do with the time factor, time-related factor, which is when a content uh, stops being of uh, some uh, public relevance. Uh, now, let me say something, that the public interest uh, of a given piece of news is not uh, marked by um, a clock nor by a calendar. Uh, it is independent of the time function. If the politician disappears uh, for a decade from the public uh, scene uh, and from the public eye and then decides to go back to the public scene, or maybe if there is another public figure that uh, takes um, his place uh, and which may be connected to that previous uh, politician, this is only an example, quite obviously, it seems to be obvious that whatever the time factor may be, the facts and the news, uh, the pieces of news having to do with that politician should be still a topical fact and will stay topical. So this is one of the things uh, showing that we cannot uh, decide uh, to forget uh, just by making use of a clock or of a calendar. So this is the way I see and look at things. And then there is another question that was asked, another fact having to do with the position and the role of a publisher or of uh, an editor-in-chief uh, whenever a uh, given uh, delisting process is uh, started uh, affecting a content. Here my position is very clear and it's in contrast uh, with the one hoped for by the European institutions uh, right now. The delisting and de-indexation has a very important impact on uh, publishing choices, uh, especially the choices of uh, the author of that given content. Uh, the online content belongs uh, in equal manner to the subject to which those personal data are to be referred and to the author of that content. That content uh, gives uh, to two subjects uh, that are somehow accountable for that uh, given right. But there is a substantial difference. Uh, the subjects, uh, the data of which are becoming relevant in that given uh, content, whether it be Google or a different uh, engine, research engine, uh, may be submitted uh, in to a judge or to an administrative authority, and they may be judged consequently. So the author of that content uh, has no right uh, so as that Google is going to be indexing that content. Uh, so if Google or that given engine is going to the list or the index uh, whenever they should not, uh, then the position of the author of that given content, uh, the position of the author or of the blogger, are not going to be protected. Uh, there is going to be no judge uh, to whom a report a complain for a given uh, tort that was uh, um, received. And then there is another consideration, and this has got to do with the last question, whereby it is up to the engine, uh, the research engine, to decide uh, whether to there is a right to be forgotten or not. Uh, here my position is very clear and very marked. There is no such right. Uh, it is not up to the uh, research engine because the decision is to be uh, left in the hands of a judge or independent authority under the control of a given authority. That decision entails a comparative uh, assessment between two fundamental rights uh, that are pertaining to the man and to the citizens. One is the privacy law, the one of uh, privacy and personal identity versus the uh, freedom to to uh, be informed. And now, this decision should never be left in the hands of a private subject who has to legitimately act according to a corporation uh, logic. Uh, so the research engine will never risk anything if it dies, but uh, it will be uh, confronted with lots of problems if it's removing that content. So from this uh, point of view, 
we will have to or we should at least to try and figure out a tool whereby the decision is not going to be derogated to the choice of a given subject, in this case a private subject. Now I am uh, finished with my time and uh, thank you for listening to my comments. No, thank you, Mr. Sforza. Um, do we have comments from the panel? Anyone would like to start? Thank you. A short, um, a brief question to you. Uh, if you have become once a public figure, I understand right that then you are in your whole life be a public figure, figure always. Or are there have you make a difference? Personalmente non penso che uh, il tema sia se quella persona the resta is, uh, whether or not uh, uh, an individual uh, remains uh, a public figure it's all about uh, his or her actions and their public interest i mean being a public figure even though we don't have you know a legal definition of public figure in a network of networks like the internet is totally irrelevant. Uh, what is public uh, in a community, in a group on Facebook, uh, isn't public uh, for most you know, uh, of our society. So I would rather put it in terms of uh, uh, for how long you know, people's or their behaviors and conducts uh, remain in the public domain. Sylvie, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, on the uh, question of the impact on history, uh, you know that some archives, some material in historical archives uh, is um, uh, classified for a number of years, 15, 20, 25, sometimes up to 50. Would that be something you would consider reasonable that, for instance, to delink, um, to, to remove a link for a number of years or, or a given period? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, it's not reasonable. I believe that this uh, decision is made by a private subject. Uh, confidentiality constraints uh, of archives uh, are generally uh, decided or established uh, by uh, uh, political uh, bodies, by institutions, public institutions, because uh, any decision is uh, in society, is in the society's best interest. When a private subject, uh, through a policy, uh, takes over in these decisions, uh, may have an impact uh, on the historian's freedom uh, to reconstruct uh, history. These days, uh, Whoever looks up uh, a search engine, uh, the search engine returns uh, a reply that may be exhaustive or not uh, on the basis uh, of the uh, engine algorithm only. So acting uh, on the algorithm uh, of a search engine uh, on the basis of time uh, constraints uh, is like uh, a constraint for the reconstruction of history. I hope I was clear enough. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Frank. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scorsa, let me see if I understood you correctly, because part of your, uh, I understood the, the whole question of history and, and why should anyone define what is a public interest to reconstruct history or redefine a historical memory of, of, of a society. Um, but it, you also made a point about who is the body or the institution that can make the decision or should make the decision. And if I understand correctly, and this is what I'd like you to clarify, in this case, this court decision is saying that it should be the, the, the search engine that should make the decision, it should be Google to make the decision, and you're saying that this is in effect dangerous for the future because although it sounds interesting, for one person that made the request, in reality is giving too much power to anyone with a search engine uh, and could be given to anyone else with a search engine and not defined by a more independent authority mm -hmm. to make the decision in a more 
uh, objective way. So this, this effectively could turn out to be a censorship um, sort of modality in the future. Is that correct, what my understanding? Assolutamente corretto. Correct, I agree. Totally correct. My point is that the, the owner, the subject, the owner of data, those who ask uh, to be de-indexed uh, in this, within this framework uh, are kind of hyper-protected, whereas on the opposite, the content uh, authors uh, have no protection at all for two reasons. Uh, they lose uh, their right to a just process, a just uh, trial before a court or anything, and they also lose the right uh, to the contradictory because uh, the indexation of contents uh, can go away without uh, ever informing uh, the author. So from my point of view, those uh, who exercise the freedom of information uh, in some way have no right uh, to protect uh, the public interest uh, to get to know, you know, any published content. Am I clear? Uh, Luciana, did you also have a question? Do we have time? Yeah, go ahead. Just make it quick. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I'm going to do this in English for uh, to help the translator. Um, <laughs> to put it simply, uh, should we trust a private uh, company uh, running the search engine to operate on the links, or should we trust a sort of uh, agency, um, governmental agency, to decide about these links? I don't think uh, that the whole issue boils down uh, to trusting or mistrusting a public subject. Indeed, uh, the rationale for making a choice uh, is totally different uh, between a, public su a private subject uh, and those who administer justice. For instance, a corporation has to maximize its profits uh, by minimizing any risk. So de-indexing uh, a content, some content, uh, uh, doesn't mean minimize the risk. Uh, it actually means uh, increasing the risk. So I, I may trust a private subject, but I should also trust the fact that a corporation uh, acts not you know, uh, as a corporations do. And in doubtful case, removing or not removing content uh, is the corporation going to choose to de-index contents? Because that's the only way to remove uh, the risk uh, of, complain, com of complaints. Uh, so mm, this decision, this choice, is not easy to be justified for a corporation. It's not justifiable for a corporation because it means uh, that uh, uh, the corporation has decided to accept or to increase risks and uh, uh, be subject uh, to a court, uh, and a court uh, could uh, uh, decide that the corporation is faulty. So I trust corporations protecting uh, the shareholders' rights. Uh, sh mm, shareholders' rights, rights are not always the same as the author uh, rights. Thank you very much, Mr. Scrozza, and thank you for, for your crisp answers and staying to our schedule. Uh, Mr. Russo, I'd like to, to go to you if, if we can. Um, Mr. Massimo Russo is the editor-in-chief of Wired Italia, published by Condé Nast, as everybody knows. Previously, he worked as the digital content director, head of the video desk, and an online journalist at Gruppo Editoriale uh, L'Espresso for 12 years. Before, he served as a reporter and a senior editor for L'Espresso Les Daily's newspaper for 10 years. He's co-authored a book called um, Rectici uh, Digitale uh, on journalism in the digital age, and he's a member of the Commission for an Internet Bill of Rights of the Italian Parliament. Please go ahead, Mr. Rousseau. Grazie. Articolerò il mio intervento in una premessa in tre considerazioni. Thank you. I will make an introduction and uh, three comments. Uh, introduction. In my view, the ruling uh, decided uh, by the European Court of Justice uh, issued last May uh, concerns uh, conflicting interests, uh, the right uh, to 
uh, be forgotten, the right uh, to uh, the freedom of expression and the right uh, to uh, protecting your own rights. Uh, we should bear in mind that uh, uh, things change over time uh, depending on uh, the uh, privacy on the availability of technology devices uh, and also on societal habits. Uh, the court ruling, in my view, underestimated Article 11 of the uh, European um, Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, ev whereby every individual, not only the media, have the right uh, to the freedom of expression and also the need uh, to be informed uh, and get to know without any frontier. This is, was underestimated because we're not talking about uh, personal data. We're talking about uh, a, a narrow uh, subgroup of uh, information published uh, uh, lawfully. So they are published online. And uh, uh, those who published uh, that information uh, did so lawfully. So no justification is required uh, to publish uh, information uh, different from private information. We should also accept uh, that the freedom of expression should not uh, conflict, uh, should not clash against uh, public uh, rights. Most uh, content uh, uh, in uh, social networks and social media should be deleted altogether if this uh, uh, opinion prevails. So the key issue is the public interest, I think. Uh, now let me make a couple of points uh, of comments uh, on the special uh, problems uh, that uh, were brought up uh, with this ruling. Uh, quite uniquely, the court uh, decided uh, to attach to a private subject, as Guido Scorza underlined uh, a while ago, the power to give uh, visibility to information, published information. Uh, third party subjects uh, are also entitled uh, to. Uh, store that information into in their database. So it is not necessary to imply that uh, such information causes prejudice uh, to the interested uh, parties. It would be much better to ask uh, the author to remove that information. Uh, this already happens, uh, by the way. In some uh, circles, I've long, uh, I've spent many years uh, in uh, uh, newspapers uh, with their own archives and databases. Anyway, in the event uh, there is no settlement is uh, achieved, is reached by the parties, the right uh, to remove content uh, from the search engine uh, indexes uh, should be established. Uh, uh, by a public subject after hearing uh, all the interested parties. Uh, otherwise, this could uh, 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 harm, you know, the collective memory. More and more, we are going to have uh, digital archives. Uh, so I don't see why, according to the European Court of Justice, uh, the uh, rights of the individual should prevail over the interest of the internet users. In my opinion, this is my first comment, uh, it would be much fairer to do the opposite, protect as much as possible the integrity of the archives and the indexes, unless after a contradictory a public subject uh, um, sees uh, that it is necessary to remove that information from the search engines. But this decision uh, should be made uh, by a public uh, body or institution. Second point. The new concept of uh, public figure. According to the court, uh, the interest of the collectivity to uh, get information, to receive information varies according to uh, the role that these people have uh, uh, in society. But how can we define this? Uh, it changes over time. We should also under, uh, under uh, un we should also underline that the internet uh, has changed the, the 
uh, notion of uh, reputation and also of a public figure. Anyone uh, in the performance of their jobs uh, does become, uh, do become uh, a public figure, a storekeeper, an artisan, uh, a uh, hotel owner, all these people have their own public profile put together and uh, uh, updated uh, daily. And indeed, uh, we go online uh, to review their services. Uh, so getting information on the quality and characteristics of these figures uh, does have a public interest, even though they are not public figures, uh, strictly speaking. Uh, while this is true for uh, uh, you know for, for people's professions uh, uh, an increasing value is being attached uh, these days uh, by uh, new services uh, like uh, time sharing carpooling uh, and similar services uh, resources and services are shared by non professionals uh, mobile devices, uh, social media are making this phenomenon uh, more and more important in our lives. Uh, and again, uh, non-professionals uh, publish uh, their reviews. Uh, so the European Court of Justice is not taking into consideration uh, such conditions at all. Otherwise, uh, it should have acknowledged them. Uh, we're always discussing about uh, lawfully published information. Uh, so by including information into search engines, of course, anyone has the right to access it. Search engines and their indexes. Uh, should we inform uh, the information author or users about uh, removal of that information from an index? Well, I think that this information is not only advisable, but also necessary. Even to an expert, it's just impossible to assess uh, what factors uh, 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 establish, uh, you know, the order or hierarchy of information into a search engine. So how can you tell whether or not uh, information has been removed uh, from the indexes? It is important uh, that any decision in this respect is uh, transparent uh, for the time being uh, publication is the only possibility for uh, authors uh, to uh, avoid uh, deletion and removal uh, however all users uh, have the right uh, to know that uh, a results page uh, has been uh, changed uh, due to some uh, strange mechanisms uh, into the uh, search engine algorithm. Uh, finally, and this has nothing to do with uh, legal uh, issues, uh, I do hope uh, that people change uh, their opinion uh, on, uh, a certain, on certain aspects. Uh, I disagree uh, uh, with uh, those who claim uh, that you have nothing to hide you shouldn't fear, you know, uh, uh, your information to become uh, uh, public. Uh, if certain information uh, becomes of public domain, the best way uh, to protect uh, that information is to object uh, to the idea of reputation uh, based uh, on uh, this misperception. Uh, Mm, there exist people who don't want to be in the spotlight. Uh, other people uh, uh, like, uh, you know, to publish, uh, to let other people know whatever they do or think. I think uh, that uh, uh, this will take time, but I think uh, that they will come where uh, the uh, ethical sense of respect uh, will uh, uh, establish uh, how these things are to be treated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Russo. Do we have comments from the panel? Yes. Yes. Luis Luis. Yes. I will speak in, in, in Italian. Now, this has got to do with the relationship existing between search engines and uh, freedom of expression. The question is the following. The search engine, is it granting or simply facilitating the right to freedom of expression. 
What I mean is today's search engines are part of a, an essential core that belongs to the freedom of expression, or is it only a mere tool that makes it more accessible? And is it an indispensable tool for the freedom of expression in the age of the internet? And then I also have a second question, i.e. the information to be given to the publisher and uh, the information of the removal intervention, according to you, is it appropriate and at the same time also necessary? Well, let me start from this last question. Yes, it is absolutely necessary. Without this, we cannot have any discussion, no debate, which may, in the end, if ever there's going to be the removal from the index uh, of the decision of the author or of the citizen that was publishing a given piece of information to republish it by just informing the public of the uh, occurrence of a cancellation or of a delinking de it over the removal. So this is the only way through which it is possible to defend oneself from such an accusation. And uh, with respect to the first question, that was raised by you, I do not believe that it's appropriate nor correct to assign to search engines a function that certainly does not belo belong to them, because they are private subjects. And I believe that this has got to do with surveillance with the freedom of expression on the web. Search engines represent a subject. They perform their own right to express themselves through a code and even writing codes, not only writing words or ideas uh, and freedom of expressions, represent the writing of a code uh, that is the decision of what needs to be preferred at the time of an answer or in a given page, whether that could place limits to a query, whether that represents a decision in itself, which then falls into under the um, chapter of freedom of expression. Well, yes, it would be hard to deny that. It would be hard to deny that search engines, especially in given countries, and especially some of them, by now have taken up such a relevant role in the life of our uh, citizens. So they represent the spectacles through which we get to know the world. So this is, I'm sure, something which will have to require the assessment and the evaluation of what this means. Probably not today, not uh, during this event. Luciano. Please forgive me, because I did not understand the rules of the game. I thought that we had to speak in English here. So let me go back to my own uh, mother tongue. Let me ask a question, maybe an academic question. For so many time, we had the press revolution. We did try to create uh, some public networks, and we did look at this uh, revolution with great attention, uh, journalism, rules, regulations. And then what happened? We were sort of uh, taken aback. Uh, we were not uh, acting in time. The state, uh, with a capital S, was delegating completely to private subjects uh, the management uh, and the handling of what was uh, the sieve of our information society the very blood of s information society. And now we're closing uh, the stables after that the um, cows have run away. Now, I've heard this many times, uh, but why has this happened? Why shouldn't they be in charge? I mean, the search engines, shouldn't they be in charge of the handling and management of links? Now, I would uh, like to ask you, why is, is it that a search engine could not turn into the poll through which we could uh, handle and manage accessibility of information. Why is it that we are so convinced that this is not so? Maybe there are some other hidden reasons behind that. Well, they themselves are private subjects. So they are competing with other subjects in building up information which is not made of truth, but rather made up of tesseras. Um, that have to be put together. And if ever we were to hold that this is to be so, that is to say that if search engines are to be recognized and granted this type of role, then we, as has been written in the academic paper, 
of uh, Larry Pages and Gibring, then they, as they said, it would be appropriate uh, that the search engine should stay within the academic uh, environment. Uh, and it should not be turned into a private subject or company having objectives that are for profit, because this otherwise would contaminate and entail contaminations such as advertising aspects and many more, which are typical of a private subject. So either we hypothesize a public statute which is supranational and extraterritorial, somehow extraterritorial for the search engines uh, and applicable to them. Uh, so they should be given a statute which is completely different from private subjects. Uh, and they will be given the right to stay on the market just like any other subject. Or I believe that this direct handling and management on their side of what is visible or what should not be made visible on the side of the public or for to the public is not appropriate. Vogliamo prevedere delle risposte adesso? Yes, I would like to ask a very uh, practical question. There is a lady, she's half a celebrity in my country, who has been confronted in the last two years with um, blog posts that she died in a car crash uh, or in a ski accident. She doesn't know who is behind the posts. So you referred in your intervention, it would be better to ask the author of the information to remove that information. But there's no way to do so. So if she asks Google to have links to those posts removed when you search for her name, then where is the harm to freedom of expression of the author who with malicious intent is posting these, well, this information which is clearly not true because she's alive and kicking. Where is the harm for freedom of expression? It has been mentioned a couple of times already. Uh, there's this balancing between privacy and freedom of expression, but does all information deserve the same protection under freedom of expression? And w where exactly is the harm if you remove links to certain information when Googling or, sorry, or using a search engine, um, using the, the person's name in a search terms in a search engine? And it's not just about Google, it's also other search engines that uh, may have to follow the ruling here. Thank you. Certo, grazie. Ma lei si riferisce però well, yes. You are referring to some uh, specific uh, behaviors that are representing a crime for which uh, there is no application of the uh, freedom of expression. Meaning by this uh, that uh, it is easy to damage someone and that is to be recognized as a crime in Italy, but in other countries as well. And it is possible through the request uh, filed to the authorities uh, to track uh, the author of that content or the one who is handling that given website. Uh, and uh, certainly you can have access to the uh, person uh, handling uh, a given website. There is no ectoplasm doing that. There is a specific uh, entity. There are some hosts, there are some subjects that do so. And in that case, it should be possible to remove the content. Uh, I do not believe that uh, this type of uh, case should fall under the chapter of our own discussion today, or of our own debate today. And I believe that with respect to my own comments, I have uh, stated many times and stressed many times that we are confronted with uh, information which is legitimately published uh, for which, even in the case of this ruling, there is a legitimate uh, right uh, of those who published it to have them stay online. Now, what you're saying is absolutely true, but then it is to be referred to a totally different case, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Um, we now have the opportunity to hear from our next expert, Mr. Gianni Riotto. Frank. I'm sorry. Uh, can you, we've run way over. Can, can you ask your question later or not? That's okay. No, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll gladly answer the question for Massimo Russo. If you ask me the question for Massimo Russo, I will answer instead <laughs> of you. <laughs> the, uh, Gianni writes a column for La Stampa and for Foreign Affairs. He has contributed op-eds to the Washington Post and Le Monde, the New York Times, and the Financial Times. He served at the editor of TG1 RDI, Il Solo 24 Ore, uh, and is a deputy S editor at Corriere della Sera. His book, Prince of the Clouds, has been awarded the Vittorini Prize in Italy and the Florio Prize in the UK. He was a finalist for the Medici Award in France, and 
the Book of the Year for BOL.com. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Gianni has received the America Award from the Italy USA Foundation in 2015. You have the floor, Mr. Riotta. Thank you very much, and I will disobey you, Mr. Schmidt, and will uh, thank the panel for inviting me because uh, it's a huge, huge opportunity to um, share ideas with you guys, especially because uh, my main point is going to be that we are having trouble and the, the European uh, uh, justice uh, is having trouble because we are trying to define and rule and understand on a moving issues. Uh, while we talk uh, the digital era and the digital uh, world goes on, and uh, we are trying to fix a subject that is not an event, is not uh, September 11 and what happened on September 11, is a process. And so defining a process is always more difficult, especially for former journalists like me, than defining uh, a, single, a single event. Uh, many years ago, actually 30 years ago, uh, I wrote my dissertation at the School of uh, Journalism at Columbia University on computer and privacy. And for many years, uh, I was very proud of this because I felt I was a pioneer on a subject that nobody, very few people uh, cared at the time. But then my pride left me very humbled because, uh, yes, it was great that we dealt with that issue then, but I was completely wrong. Every, if you read this on the file at Columbia, if you read that, it's totally wrong because we assumed, and most of the uh, scholars then assumed that it was the private citizen that uh, should defend his data against the, the, the state, against huge companies trying to snatch information from him. What happened was exactly the opposite, as you know, uh, much better than me, that, that the people, the ordinary individuals, gladly share his most embarrassing uh, pictures, his information, his data, uh, the blogs, write whatever uh, uh, we have in mind. And so it was actually the other way around. We didn't understand what privacy was all about and why would we fail to understand that. And this is actually the reason why professional journalism is in trouble today. Is not because uh, uh, there is the web, but uh, is because we missed the great shift, the great divide between between the 20th century and the 21st century. The 20th century was a century of masses. In war, in production, information, the mass was uh, ruling history. The 21st century is a century, at least in the Western world, of individuals. Uh, uh, you fight as a single uh, commando operator, or as a single uh, guerrilla fighter, you make information as a single user, and you deal information, and you deal your privacy as a single uh, uh, private uh, individual. This is what the uh, uh, people uh, uh, at the European Justice Court fail uh, to, to understand. Don't get offended with them. Don't get offended with them. It's not that they have anything against uh, Googles or against the, uh, the, the... That's how Europe uh, exists. Europe thinks uh, there is a problem, yes, we'll establish a rule, and the problem is solved. <laughs> and this is like in agriculture, in the economy, in the euro, and everything. Uh, uh, and there is, a, in the European public opinion, a, a, a strong sense that uh, the, the globalization and the digital world uh, sort of uh, knows us something that is basic to the uh, European uh, core of value. And so sometimes the reaction is like, let's stop time, let's stop the, 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 the clock like I would like to do it and then speak for the next uh, 15 minutes, let's stop the watch. That's what the sentence was all about, let's stop the watch. But he cannot, they cannot. And if you ask me, I, I was wrong 30 years ago, and again, uh, after September 11, I was uh, at the time working with the uh, uh, people at the West Point Academy, and the professors there were putting uh, freedom and security on an uh, axis and trying to establish how much liberty they should renounce in favor of much security. And the, the students, that they were the officers that then fought the, the war in Iraq, in Afghanistan in the future, were trying to as decide how much freedom and how much security. This is what we are uh, uh, at today. Even in the United States, after Mr. Snowden and Mr. Uh, Green will uh, reveal the extent uh, of the metadata uh, collection uh, uh, from the uh, NSA, there was some shift in, in privacy. People became a little more interested in what uh, privacy is all about. It's different, the idea of privacy in the United States than it is in Europe, but I promise you something that I've seen 
privacy and the idea of privacy and the sense of the individual privacy shifting so much that I promise that when the next uh, terroristic attack will hit um, Europe or the United States, you'll see the pendulum swinging back you'll see the pendulum swing it back. And then people will react in a totally different way. So your trouble, and I envy, uh, I envy your job because it's going, it's going to be very exciting, is to understand uh, a, a tide that is still moving. It's still moving. And so we have to try to uh, pin down, and it's going to be impossible. So let's focus, please, let's focus, please, uh, on, on, the, on, on the process. Uh, when I was a student at Columbia University, privacy and uh, the public figure was fantastically simple. You will read the New York Times versus Sullivan, the historical uh, sentence of the Supreme Court, uh, uh, or you will read, and it was actually a funnier case, uh, Ron Galella, the king of the paparazzi, uh, versus uh, former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, and it was easy. It was easy. Uh, a public figure was game. You could write anything you wanted about them, but um, as the judges established in the Galella case, you have to be tasteful. In England, it was different because the paparazzi has a much uh, greater degree of invasion, of freedom of invasion uh, uh, for public figures. And, but it was clear what the public figure was, and it was clear what a a, a, a private person was and the access that you had. Today is not like that anymore because, uh, uh, as my uh, friend and colleagues try to uh, define yet, what is a public figure? Who is a public figure? When I post something uh, on, on Facebook, am I a public figure? And uh, if I became, if I am elected senator in, in, in five years, okay, is my former girlfriend, when I was a totally nobody, uh, does she have a right to post the pictures that she, uh, I gave her? Uh, I'm a public figure today, but I wasn't a public figure when I shared the pictures with her. And of course, as a senator, I would never share the stupid picture that I shared when I was a, 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 a free roaming uh, young boy. Try to pin down this with a set of rules and you will fail. Massimo is younger than me, so he hopes to change the cultural mood and I uh, <laughs> feel for it because he would fail. <laughs> it will fail because uh, it, 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 we have to build a new culture, and we, indeed we have. Indeed, we have to build a, a new culture. Things uh, that are happening today were unthinkable ten years ago. Uh, if the mail of the boss of the CIA is not safe, why do I have to assume that mine is safe? If my uh, entry on Wikipedia can be uh, changed every day, should I go there every day and deal with the trolls that changes every day? Should I, this is something that happens. And at a certain point, uh, the only way that we have, but I understand that for the lawmakers and for the, uh, is different, is to, and I uh, agree with Massimo on this, you have to follow the tide. You have to follow the tide. Um, I think that Google, uh, since then you, here you represent Google, I think that Google eventually will come out the winner in the issue because uh, the, the tide of history is in your favor and, and people will, and the court and the European uh, system of law will follow. But the problem is still there and the problem will be there for you to, to judge. And what is the problem? The, the best definition uh, that I find uh, in, in so many years is in the uh, Gospel of St. John. Uh, because St. John says, um, you'll know uh, the truth and the truth will make you free. And this is fantastic for people that do my job and for people that do your job. And at the same time, uh, a few lines later, he say, uh, but people prefer darkness to light. Mm. And this is like what we have to work between. We know that giving truth to people will, will make them free. And very often people, and please let's not be smug, people include us as well, it's not them, it's us, it's us. Sometimes people will prefer darkness to light. Thank you very much and I'll give you 30 seconds left. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Riotta. Um, Frank, I think you get a chance to ask anyone any question, <laughs> if you'd like to begin. Well, 
it, it was... I, I'll give my 36 seconds to, to Massimo <laughs> if he wants to answer you. No, actually, it was a question that is valid for all, all uh, speakers up to now, which, because there, there is, and, and it has to do with uh, one of the comments uh, from, from, from the council, is that it was, it has been implied and said very clearly that um, there has to be a balance between the right to privacy, which is very important, and the right to freedom of expression, in the sense that all rights are interrelated and interdependent, but at the same time, the exercise of some rights, if misused, can actually harm the exercise of other rights, and this is the position in which we should not fall. And basically, all three speakers have mentioned that if a decision goes too far in terms of limiting access to information, it would be a breach of freedom of expression in the right to, free, to access information. And although it may have a good intention for one individual, it ultimately is affecting a public exercise of a public good, which is the idea of having access to information in general. And I think it was very important to talk about the exclusion when it is uh, an illegal or illegitimate use which falls under the limitations of freedom of expression, because obviously that is not that is malicious information and that's not rightful information. So uh, how severe would this be seen? And, and secondly, since this is only related to search engines, it, I, I constantly hear as an argument that it is not limiting the information because the information is there, it's only limiting one technology that makes it faster to access that information. But that in reality is an argument that one could use for internet in general. I mean, one could go to a library, a public library, or, and look for, for old newspapers or for old uh, files and look for them by hand. Or, and the idea is that internet was created as a way of developing faster forms of communication. So mm, are we, by limiting the use of the technology, effectively limiting what today is the common form of accessing information or not? And would that be the breach of freedom of expression that was being mentioned by all three speakers? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, te technology is not uh, bad, is not uh, good, uh, neither is neutral, a, a famous uh, saying goes. Uh, you know, I have honestly an easy, an easy answer to that that then is very difficult to implement, is that uh, is the old difference between art and pornography. If we try to define what is art and what is pornography, it's almost impossible to find a definition, but we immediately know what is art and what is uh, 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 pornography. And the same thing is true uh, uh, about uh, malicious information and uh, maybe part Partisan, but decent, decent information. Uh, I, I saw online in a major uh, Italian publication uh, uh, a, a young reporter, a, a digital reporter, uh, filming uh, a, a, an Italian politician that was snoring on a train, and then when he was uh, startling and woke up, he started the, the, the interview. And of course, the guy, the guy came out as a perfect ass, but. To me, that's malicious journalism, because you don't uh, take pictures of a guy that doesn't know that you are taking pictures of him just to make fun of him. Online, the new digital journalists love that, and they lapped it up. Uh, my students know, and some of them are here in the audience, I always tell them, new media, all values. New media, all values. The same sense of decency, fairness, equanimity, uh, independent style that was right in the old media is not obsolete today. Is not obsolete today. It is more than important today. And I, as you know, I mean, uh, my, my old colleagues tease me because they say that I am uh, uh, an enthusiast for uh, the new media, and I am, and I am, simply because my mission is to export those old values in the new media. I don't know if I uh, answer your question, but that's the best I can do. And we have a question. Uh, we have a question from Sylvie, and can you ask your question quickly as well, Sylvie? Quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you've touched uh, on this issue a little bit, but I would like you to elaborate if you can. In, in, you, the, the tide of uh, the tide 
Is it the same on both sides of the Atlantic regarding privacy? Do you see a, a different attitude in the way this process is moving in Europe and in America? In, I, I may be wrong. From all the data I, I have seen and from living uh, part-time in Europe and in the United States, my feeling is that the user online is exactly the same, especially if he is under 35. There is absolutely no difference between my students at Princeton University and my students here at the School of Government of Lewis, exactly the same reaction. Uh, the intellectuals, the analysts, have a different cultural approach, more open in the United States and more, uh, I don't say more close, but I would say more respectful or more worried about privacy uh, in Europe. So I think you see a divide between the general public and mass opinion and uh, the analysts, the ruling class, the journalists, and, and, and that's something that is very interesting. And we'll see if the Snowden uh, Greenwall uh, tied and they got a Pulitzer Prize last year doesn't change things in the United States as well. This, this, that may happen. And Sveen? Yes. I understood your statement that we are living uh, in a post-privacy century. Is that right? And uh, I will ask you, in the future, is there the individual, an object of NSA, of company, of uh, social media and others, what can we do, governments, scientists, politicians and so on, to defend the rights of the individual? What can we do there? This is a very interesting uh, uh, proposition. And of course, the, the, the idea of privacy, um, it, it, it has evolved because farmers in the, uh, uh, before the Industrial Revolution had no idea that something was private. Well, they, 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 their their uh, rulers had access to the, whatever they, they were owning or hiding and stuff. So it's something that developed with democracy and with the, uh, uh, with the world. But um, what is changing is that um, since we are talking about uh, Google, uh, with our students, we do always an experiment with Gmail. You start sending Gmail about going on vacation somewhere in Sicily, since I'm from, for, from Sicily, and then you get, start getting advertisements, uh, go to Sicily, buy this in Sicily. So this is clear that it's not that somebody, it's not that Mr. Wells reads my mail and says, like, go to Sicily, but there is a, a, an algorithm that decides that. And so do the student um, get worried about that? Not at all. Not at all. They are perfectly aware uh, that they are trading something, that they are trading the free access to a service of mail with data that are shared with the advertisers. So. Their sense of privacy is different from my dad's sense of privacy, because if you had told my dad, uh, do you mind if I read your mail and I'll give you uh, a, a free Coke for that? My father was like, no, ever. <laughs> uh, um, because it's different. It's a different sense of, uh, of privacy. I guess that a, a, a much younger generation will have a different uh, people that were born in the digital world. I think that they will have a different uh, sense that we have, not because they're going to be less jealous of what they own, but because they feel that they are part of a community. They feel that their Facebook friends have access to their uh, soul more than uh, you and I. Thank you, Mr. Riotta. But they don't want that the NSA has access to their data, I think. No uh, one wants this. Uh, if you look does, at the poll, does the clock may, still work? May, no, no. May, may, may I? May I? No. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Answer your answer. If you look at the polls in the United States, uh, you're wrong. It, nobody is quite a few millions of Americans. Um, if you look at what will happen in the future, you may be right. If you ask me if the NSA program was right, it was dumb. They were it was done. They were collecting information that nobody read. It was so much information that nobody read. So not only was wrong, but also it didn't work. It didn't work. Thank you very they, much. They should have read the newspapers about ISIS. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Riotta. We're going <laughs> to, the good news is we're going to hear from Lorella Zanardo. Uh, she's a writer, documentarist, documentarianist, activist, and a member of the expert committee in the Parliament of Internet Rights. She wrote a book about the exploitation of women on television, a blockbuster on the internet watched by seven million people. She's also a member of the advisory board of WIN, an international women's conference, an organizational consultant, an educator, and a lecturer. She's a member of the parliamentary commission in charge of preparing a draft internet bill of rights, which will be presented in October of this year. Go ahead. Io credo che la necessità di equilibrare due diritti fondamentali the need to balance uh, two fundamental rights, uh, the right to information and the right to privacy, including the right to be forgotten, can hardly find uh, a final definitive solution. In most cases, time uh, criteria uh, to decide whether or not uh, a request uh, to remove a link is justified uh, may apply, but there are also situations where it is necessary to go deeper into this, uh, and possibly you can have to, you may have to change your mind. Uh, responding automatically to requests uh, may be inconvenient, uh, but also unavoidable because the collection and management of data on individuals uh, is going to be more and more complicated with the internet uh, and the way it, it is used. Uh, so striking a balance between privacy having to do with the individual uh, and the right to information, a collective dimension of relations uh, quite decisive uh, for democracy is so important uh, and this can't be settled, uh, you know, once and for all, I think. Uh, moreover, organizations, either public or private, uh, how can they find, you know, this uh, uh, request uh, uh, in a univocal uh, uh, way? Uh, certainly, they want to... Uh, be trusted by citizens and consumers. Uh, now, I focus on two main questions. Uh, number one, does the format of a context, the uh, image versus text, uh, matter? The type of content is important. Uh, for instance, images, pictures are a content uh, people should pay a lot of attention to. On the web, this is much uh, sought after because uh, it gets the message across right away. Images uh, uh, go to the mm, uh, uh, perceived uh, by a uh, uh, broader audience uh, much more than uh, written text. Uh, young people tell their life about images. Instagram, for instance, allows people uh, to talk to others only through pictures without writing anything at all. Furthermore, and that's also very important, individual images, images of the face, of our face, uh, images of uh, uh, our body are uh, uh, very sensitive data, the most uh, sensitive data, the face of a person. We are here today, we are looking at each other, uh, we look ourselves uh, 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 into the eye. Uh, face uh, comes from Latin, uh, faccia, to do. That's the meaning of the original verb. Uh, a face uh, is a unique feature, and it also points uh, to the vulnerability of a person. So visual information of people whose acts uh, are of public importance uh, uh, in themselves are not. Let me make an example to make myself clear. Seeing the face of someone who has been arrested uh, or raped, maybe images taken from uh, uh, other times in their life and not during the arrest uh, or the rape uh, don't add anything to uh, the news. So that's uh, just uh, a needless uh, uh, voyeurism because, as I said, the face is very vulnerable for anyone and uh, we represent ourselves uh, through our face. This is particularly true for younger generations uh, who tell themselves about faces. Uh, the issue of faces uh, is made even more important by uh, face recognition uh, software based uh, on internet images. Uh, if those pictures and images are used illicitly, 
they may turn into a, a very serious threat to privacy. So asking to uh, a link to be removed uh, may be judged inappropriate uh, on the basis of text only, but it can be justified on the basis of uh, the visual content, uh, the picture. The second issue I focused on is, is the content integral uh, to preserving a historical public record? I think that the internet uh, contents are going to be more and more important uh, for historical documentation and to preserve uh, human culture. However, there are two possible traps or mistakes uh, regarding uh, the Internet uh, and the entire world uh, as the same thing. Uh, the Internet uh, does affect uh, the world, uh, has an impact on the world, uh, but it isn't the world. Uh, whatever you can find online is important, is relevant, uh, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, there exist uh, more and more things about uh, phenomena and individuals, and that can be found uh, not online, uh, as it were. Another possible mistake is believing uh, that uh, whatever you find online uh, is good and can be used for historical uh, documentation. This is only, uh, this is true only to an extent, only to a point, uh, because much depends uh, on the organized uh, nature of um, such information. So, in other words. Uh, in terms of historical memory, it is quite important to organize data rather than preserving them altogether. Most data illustrating the life of a society are quite similar. So uh, you don't need to, uh, uh, to have huge amounts of data. You should rather organize them systematically and effectively. Some things uh, are important uh, for the individual's privacy and maybe uh, less important for uh, documentarists uh, and uh, historical research. Data about people involved in certain facts and circumstances uh, uh, like, you know, crimes against humanity, uh, the uh, hierarchical order uh, uh, just is just the opposite. I mean, the public dimension uh, takes over. Let me also make another of uh, another couple of uh, brief points, uh, and I also ask you to think about this. If you fear that information about us survives us uh, in the future, can we freely express our opinion on, say, gossip uh, or sharing personal experiences? Uh, uh, casting a comment on political factors, uh, or are we going to rather go for self-censorship? Because this is also important, because our behaviors change. Remembering, uh, recollecting, not forgetting is one of the most important gifts of human beings, including for uh, technical, scientific uh, uh, disciplines uh, and the arts. Over uh, the centuries, uh, people have uh, learned uh, how to come to terms with their errors, uh, like uh, repenting or shame. But this can be just preliminary or transient. Being persistently faced uh, with your own uh, uh, mistakes, uh, as uh, it just happens online, may prevent people from uh, uh, redeeming their mistakes. Uh, so persistent memory and the right to be forgotten, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, do comply with this need. Uh, in conclusion, according to my, in my personal uh, experience as activist uh, and my work uh, on uh, uh, raising uh, the awareness of people and the uh, uh, conscious use of the internet for young people. I think it, that it is quite important uh, to educate young people, even when it comes to the right to be forgotten. Internet uh, is a huge, great thing, uh, but it should be used uh, in uh, a, a conscious manner. Young people uh, should learn uh, how to use uh, uh, the internet and their data better. They should become more aware of uh, what happens by publishing information about themselves. In this way, people can learn how to control information about themselves, uh, thereby minimizing, uh, you know, uh, risky, you know, situations like 
asking to remove data or links. So thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Ms. Sonata. Questions from the panel? Sylvie has a question. Um, I understand you're part of um, this parliamentary commission which is working on the Internet Bill of Rights. Yeah. Is, is the right to be forgotten addressed in this uh, Bill of Rights? Yes, it's one of uh, è una in, part. In, and in what, what way? Yeah. Uh, è una part abbiamo, uh, uh, ci siamo appena... Well, the, the uh, commission uh, was uh, established uh, recently and uh, our agenda includes uh, a debate on the right to be forgotten, the right to information. We have held uh, one meeting so far. Uh, the commission consists, uh, has a membership of 20, half of them are parliamentarians, uh, half are experts, uh, so we're still, you know, in the early days. Uh, Anyway, this is one of the themes of the topics to address. Uh, and also we want to discuss education uh, for young generations. This is quite compelling in Italy and not only here, and not just in Italy. You talked about repenting and shame and this uh, process of uh, removal. Uh, and if I understood correctly, you also discussed uh, the right to be forgotten as a tool, as an instrument in this uh, redemption process. Uh, don't you think we should rather uh, use the expression uh, uh, the right to one's own past? Uh, for instance, take the European Court of Justice ruling. Why Mario Costeja should be worried today in 2014 for uh, lawful information which dates back to 1998 if he has the right uh, to that past experience. I mean, why should we fear uh, that, you know, pictures, images, comments, uh, unless illicit or unlawful. I mean, why should we fear this about the future? Don't you think this is a bit too much? Uh, we live in an open democracy. What should be avoided uh, is, uh, I mean, we don't want to pay the price. Uh, uh, we don't want to cause uh, uh, negative consequences. Uh, uh, to, to anyone. I think that we should uh, all have the right uh, to our own past. Uh, both things are valuable. When, when I say education, uh, I, I mean uh, educating boys and girls uh, so that in the future uh, what you have just explained can happen. Uh, it's very unlikely today. Uh, look uh, at the ferocious meanness, uh, you know, of uh, 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 teenagers. Uh, so what you uh, wish uh, is uh, absolutely uh, acceptable and reasonable, but our society is not ready yet for this. Uh, so if I take a picture, I took, an, you know, an embarrassing picture when I was 16, and then I go to a job interview, that shouldn't have any importance, any weight at all. So we want to educate uh, boys and girls, young boys and girls, to avoid this. At the same time, I think that any individual, every individual should be have the right uh, to change, you know, over time. Uh, there is a beautiful comedy, uh, a beautiful drama by Luigi Pirandello, an Italian uh, uh, author entitled uh, Il Fu Mattia Pascal, the late Mattia Pascal. It's just about this, you know, in life, you can change. You have the right to change. And uh, a number of religions uh, all in, in, you know, over the centuries uh, have uh, uh, stressed the importance of uh, uh, repenting oneself and starting it uh, all over again. I think that this uh, should be debated uh, thoroughly. I don't want to go into philosophy, but 
I truly appreciated uh, Massimo Russo's uh, presentation uh, on uh, the de-linking of information to be lawfully published. Uh, and this, because it is decided, uh, established by a court. Uh, so where is, you know, the divide? Uh, and speaking of education, I think we should uh, accept consequences. Uh, we live in uh, a Newtonian world. Uh, when something has happened, uh, it has already happened. If you go bust, uh, you go bust. It's going to stay in the records. So I think that speaking of education, we should also uh, teach uh, young people that there are uh, consequences uh, that uh, uh, you pay forever, that are going to stay forever. I agree, but uh, we should decide whether we want to educate uh, young people uh, uh, to things that are happening now or to what's going to happen in two decades. Uh, sin. Uh, Repent, uh, shame, uh, guilt uh, are quite important in some countries. So many times, you know, mm, I don't think it is fair for people to pay the price of their past consequences forever. However, even though you have the right to be forgotten, I think we should educate young people to, be, to become aware of the consequences of their actions. This problem can't find, you know, a quick uh, solution. This is a profound issue. We should start, you know, initiate changes. Uh, for instance, uh, we should uh, possibly educate people to become quite attentive to what they publish. And if they make a mistake, uh, OK, fine. Uh, it's not a problem, but uh, in today's uh, society, this may not be true. I mean, if you make a mistake, uh, you have to, you may have to pay for that mistake uh, for a long time. Thank you. So, um, we finished our first part. We're going to take a, a quick five-minute break. And one of the most important things is questions should go here to my right over there. Please write them out. We'll have plenty of time for questions. It will return in five minutes. I think the first session was fantastic, and I really appreciate everybody sticking to the time. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. I'd like to begin by introducing our, our second set of four with our next expert, Alessandro Montalero. Uh, Alessandro is an aggregate professor in uh, the Politecnico di Torino and a faculty fellow at the Next Center for Internet and Society. He's a visiting researcher at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society visiting fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute and a visiting professor at Nanjing University of Science and Technology. You've been all over the world. Um, go ahead, Professor Montalero. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a legal scholar, so I start with a disclaimer. My speech will be in English because there are some terms that are legal terms, and so I, it could be better. As a scholar, I think that uh, you have to focus on the problem and then to search for a possible solution rather than discussing in general. So the framework. The framework is characterized by two different rights. The right to be forgotten and the right to erasure. In my opinion, are not the same right. There is a distinction between both these rights. The right to erasure is a wider right and is not related to the traditional context of the right to be forgotten that uh, is uh, referred to the balancing between uh, media and individual life. There are many other aspects in terms of wrongful or illicit processing of personal information that are covered by the right to erasure and are not covered by the right to be forgotten. So this distinction, I think, is, is necessary. Second aspect, with regard, always in the framework, with regard to the right to be forgotten, this right is not a new right. This right still exists both in Europe and in the US. Although in the US is, uh, uh, there is a different approach to this right uh, and uh, as a, a 
less wide extension, a narrow extension. Um, the focus of the right to be forgotten is the balancing of interest, as uh, probably you, are, you know. <laughs> but uh, this balancing of interest is context-related and is time-related. This balance of interest is based on the current relevance of past events. And it's based on the social value or the knowledge of these past events. If both as element are not present, there is not the right to know and there is the right to be forgotten. If there is a non an actual collective interest, general interest to know something of the past of the, your individual life, there is not this uh, kind of right to inform and you have the right to be forgotten. This is recognized in Europe by different um, courts and is also recognized in a narrow way also by US courts and case law. This is the framework. The problem is represented by the decision of the European court. I agree with the decision. I think that uh, is correct in uh, its fundamental elements. And uh, I think that uh, there is a legal basis of this right to be forgotten. But uh, at the same time, I think there, that there are some problems in the way in which the court suggests to enforce, to protect this kind of right in the practical solution. And at the same time, I think that uh, this is a political decision. It's a decision that is uh, formally focused on the directive, but look forward to the new European regulation. And so the discussion will be on the Article 17, or more in general, on the provision of the new regulation. And with regard to this topic, I think that uh, the the solution could not be the balancing test made by a private company. Not because this is not possible. In the media law, journalists and companies in the sector of media make this kind of balancing. But they have a specific background. And they know the facts. They know if there is or there is not a collective interest to know this news or not. So they have the skills, they have the professional skills to address this kind of question. Google has not this because make another business, in my opinion. It's not a media company. And at the second, it's not a com um, an entity that collects the information and creates the news. To make the balance of interest, you had to know the fact and have a direct knowledge of the fact to know if there is or there is not the collective interest to know that. The solution, I think that solution could be represented by a specific provision in the article of the proposal on the right to be forgot on the right to register now. <laughs> a specific provision, a legal provision so no, by court, but by a legal provision. And the provision will focus on a sort of temporary erasure of the link. So when a data subject requires to enforce its right to be forgotten, the company could be compared for a limited period, 30 days, not show the link in the list of the results. If within 30 days you don't start a legal action in front of an authority, because the balancing test should be made by an authority, data protection authority, uh, courts, like you want. If after 20, 30 days nobody has made this action, the link will be act reactivated. If the action starts, the link will be in a situation of uh, not, be, not to be shown in the result of the list till the end of the decision. I know that one 
possible observation and criticism is that we have a lot of requests and data protection authority will not be able to address all these requests. I think that we have a lot of requests also because we have created, Google has created a system that permits to make a lot of requests. I think that uh, the access to code sometimes should be restricted in order to allow the access, permit the access only to the people that have a real interest. It's quite different knowing that you have to make a complaint to a data protection authority or filling the blanks of a format and uh, clicking on it. In the second case, it's also trivial requests should be processed. In the first case, the cost of the judicial, judicial system limits and selects the real interest. And the past history in Europe, and not only in Europe, is in this sense. I think that Google, but also many other companies, addressed in the past the problem of the right to be forgotten. There were requests about the erasure of specific information, or specific links, and so on. And the number was not a so high number. But that kind of requests were filtered and selected and decided by an independent court and independent authority. I think that this is a balance between the interest to protect the user, the data subject, and the interest to permit to companies to make their business in a privacy-oriented way. I leave one minutes and 30 seconds for you. <laughs> yeah. Let's have some questions or comments from our panel. Jimmy, would you like to start? Um, <clears throat> yes, I just have a, a really a, a history or factual question. I wonder if you could elaborate more on uh, the right to be forgotten uh, in the United States. Uh, you, you mentioned that, and that uh, I think most people would find surprising. In the United States, the right to be forgotten intense, again, the problem is the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten. If you consider the right to be forgotten, the specific decision by the, the US courts that recognize the right to, and also the second restatement of the torts that recognize your right to hidden your past if there is not a public interest to know. There are some decision and it is in the second uh, statement of the torts. The problem is that in the US, the idea of public records and the idea of freedom of expression is broader interpreted than in many European countries. And so the balancing is quite different. But we have the same rights. The problem is where you put in the middle, the stick in the middle. So the notion is common in both, in my opinion, it's common both in, in Europe and in US, and I also I, I studied this topic with a specific publication. But uh, the difference is uh, the range, the extension in which the right to be forgotten is protected in in US. And uh, looking forward to the future, I think that uh, also in US there is an interest in this field to increase the protection of privacy with regard to the past events of your life. So for this reason, I think that we had to, to find a solution. I suppose I, I was actually looking for something much more specific because I'm unaware of any court cases in the US that would uphold uh, censorship of legally published information uh, due to right to be forgotten under any circumstances. And if there are such, it'd be very interesting to know about that. It's not censorship. Censorship is quite different. From the second restatement of torts, paragraph 652D, comment K, past event and so on, the past event and activities may still be uh, of legitimate interest to the public and the narrative reviving recollection of what has happened ever many years ago might both interesting and valuable for the purpose of information and education. Such lapse of time is, however, a fact to be considered with other facts in determining 
whether the policy goes to unreasonable length in revealing facts about one who has resumed the private, lawful, and an exciting life led by the Great Book of Government. Second, Restament of Tours. Uh, Sabine, uh, Peggy, you had a question? I will resist. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, interesting intervention. I'm intrigued by what you uh, proposed as a solution. So let's have a temporary removal. And if, let's say, within one month you don't start a legal proceeding, the link is uh, restored. But if I understand the court ruling, that's exactly what Mr. Costeja has done. He did start a court ruling, but his problem was still not solved because with regard to the um, with regard to the newspaper, it was uh, decided the information was published legitimately, uh, so it should stay there. But the link was still showing up in the search results when you were looking for his name. So don't you see a conflict uh, in, with what you propose and, and, and the court ruling? How can we solve that dilemma? Thank you. Thanks. I think that now we are working without a legal frame on this specific topic. We are working on a, in a system based on a directive that was approved in 1996 with a completely different context. For this reason, we had to need a new provision that considered the specific case, both the right to be forgotten and the role of search engine. Another point that I have not time to, to consider is the role of search engine. I don't think that we could compare search engine to a common general data controller. We need a doc provision. And uh, with an ad hoc provision that defines the process, we, we have a, a clear framework. We are not the risk that the link will be um, the link and then reactivated without any rules uh, uh, by the decision of a court of another or the first carried on the appeal and so on. But if there is a specific provision that defines the path, define the, the process, both by the side of the user and the side of the um, search engines or other companies, it's clear what is the process and we can apply without any problem. I think that the situation now is critical because we have not a specific rule, so we go on with interpretation. And there are, the risk is to have many different interpretations, many ways to address these issues. I don't know if I have given the answer to your question, but I hope. I'll go ahead, thank you. May I continue um, with regard to the procedure that you propose? Would it um, help if we would perhaps reverse or the link is removed during a certain period. And if the source of the information who is now informed, they get a notification that links to sp specific information have, have been removed for certain search, uh, from certain, certain search results. So if at that moment the source of the information doesn't react within a certain period, you leave the link removed with that? What, would, what do you think about that uh, approach? I think that uh if the user have a, a real interest, an actual interest, to protect his right to be forgotten, he had to act to the court or to a data protection authority. If you remove the link and the link remain removed, then there is, could be a long time in which the search engine don't know what to do with this kind of link. You had to, to fix a term. This is a, it's a legal instrument in many cases, so like when you buy something that doesn't work. You have a limited term of time, you decide, or you maintain the things that work, doesn't work, because you go to the shop and say, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you have the time, a short time, to decide. And during the time, I prefer the, the model in which during the time, the result is not uh, in the list be between the time, request and uh, the, the, the start of the action. Because I think this approach is uh, more in the interest of the user that is the weaker part uh, or, or is the so main interest in this context. Let's, uh, let's have a very quick question from Jose Luis. Go ahead. This is very quick. <laughs> um, 
The Court of Justice, let's assume that the Court of Justice has opted in favor of a very specific, a very specific uh, uh, question. Let's consider the Spanish Court. And let's assume that in the case, in object, the authority, the Spanish authority for the privacy has decided to oblige to make it mandatory for the website to cancel, to erase the data. At that point, the question would be not only concerning the search engine, but also the website. At that point, I wonder, what would be your opinion? According to you, what would be the solution? What could the Court of Justice decide in the face of both subjects. One is the search engine and the other is the website. I think that the request was addressed to the Google because uh, there, we had also to consider that there are some cases in which it's not so easy to find uh, the author or the publication, the, the website, uh, master and so on. Uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, the court uh, do not con it considers also the aspect of the website, but the request was focused on the role of Google. So I think it, there is an implicit assumption. If you make the request directly to the website, there is a traditional process that is always adopted that is limiting the access, modifying the robots.txt file or other solution that were are still adopted by Data Protection Authority in Europe. And this is the main way. But there are many cases in, in this, there are some cases in which this is not possible. And so you ask to the gatekeeper, to Google or other big companies. Again, in my proposal, this system that created a little burden also induced the user to reflect if it is not better to ask directly to the webmaster or to the newspaper website. Because now what happens? Many colleagues that work, uh, that are lawyer, say me, now the result is that uh, we don't make action against each newspaper, but we make action against Google because it is. So this is a wrong approach. I think that uh, Google, like many other, uh, should be the last solution for specific case in which you are not able to identify the author, which you, while you have not a feedback when the author is in a country, in country in which you are not able to, or it's a, a, an excessive cost to make a international legal action and so on. So we have two different solutions that could be work together and we consider, uh, the user will consider which is the best solution. I think that. Uh, it's a, a wide topic, uh, not so to the we've, <laughs> to all the we've, we've run well over. Yeah. Can, can, we, can we go ahead and move to our next, next panelist? Um, but thank you very much for that and your specific proposal. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Elio Cat Catania. He's the chairman of, uh, is it Confindustria Digitale, the federation of ICT companies in Italy. He graduated from the, with an electrotechnical engineering from La Sapienza here in Rome and he gained his master's degree in management science from Sloan at the MIT in Boston. He spent most of his management career at IBM, where he ran IBM Latin America, Southern Europe, and Italy, and became a member of the Worldwide Council. He has also been chairman and CEO of Ferrovie de lo Sato, chairman and CEO of the ATM Group Milan Transport Company, and deputy chairman of Alitalia. He served as a board member and a member of the executive committee of Telecom Italia, and as a board member of Intesa San Paolo. He's a Knight of Labor, he's a member of the Executive Committee of Assonimi and the Executive Committee of the Council of the United States in Italy, and a member of the Board of Directors for Fondazione Astri Onius. So uh, would you like to take the floor, Mr. Catania? Thank you very much, Eric. I have a four ballots point, two minutes each. I hope I can make it. <laughs> First, we are here in front of a very delicate and substantial question which is how to find the balance point between privacy and uh, public interest. And even though we are discussing uh, 
and our, uh, we are concentrating our conversation around the right to be forgotten, uh, the ruling and the consequent uh, implications are extremely important for the entire web industry. This is a strategic question we're discussing here today. Find the right balance point. Uh, this requires, in my view, a clear definition, as much as we can, of an objective set of rules, criteria, grids, to avoid the uncertainties, mismanagement, and creating instead a transparent and firm environment for people and citizens. It's a complex task, very complex task. There are several dimensions which have to be crossed. The figure of the requester, the matter, the relevance, the timing, the intersection with the laws, with the local laws. In my view, there is no way a search engine operator, an internet service provider, an enterprise, a private enterprise can carry this task and this responsibility. And this takes me to the second point. This responsibility should be placed on an official independent institution. Better if properly supported. Only an official institution, in fact, can define uh, what are the best boundaries between public and private figure. By the way, a general statement could be that public are those being elected by vote or anyway carrying a general interest responsibility. Only an official independent institution can define what are the matters of general interest. Think, for example, to the open data issue in the public sector. Only an official independent institution can decide, can decide and define what is the appropriate time frame by matters, by role. Only an independent institution can define, in case it, by the way of public figures, what is left anyway in his own public or own, own public uh, uh, pu uh, private domain to be forgotten. And by the way, only an official institution can sort the contradiction which are taking place in some countries where uh, sentences or uh, ruling can go and override some right of privacy, like the recent uh, uh, ruling here of the Supreme Court, which make public on the web all the content of, the, of all the sentences uh, in the civil and in the, and in the, uh, 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 in the, in the civil, civil field. Third point. We consider inappropriate and dangerous classify a search engine as an editor, as somebody is stating today. And in general, classifying an, an internet service provider as a processing of personal data. In my view, has to be clearly separated. Those who generate information and carry the consequent responsibility from those who can facilitate through indexes the research of those data. As an industry, we have to avoid to put a burden on operators with impossible tasks, like uh, to ensure that the data being removed from another platform. How can you do that? We should not overburden companies with impossible technical tasks, like, for example, to keep track of all data being placed by whatever source in whatever platform. And by the way, in general terms, there is a huge, let's say, political risk or industrial policy risks. If we live with the private companies, the burden to do this work, this task, how many companies can really do that? Only the large corporation, those who have the assets to do that. This means closing the market, while on the other hand, we want to open the market, incent people to invest, even small companies. Fourth point, I do not consider appropriate making public knowledge of submitted request for cancellation because we can have the, the other consequences, which is to give publicity again. While on the other hand, the issuer of the original information should be notified. Professional consumer cases, criminal history should follow similar rules. 
we should be simple. In conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I personally believe that in discussing this issue, in dealing with this issue, we are entering in uh, new uncharted territories. Only through a strict cooperation between private companies, industry, and uh, public official authorities can be defined the best way to solve this, this approach. We have to work with uh, surgical precision here to avoid, on one side, the lack of clarity, on the other side, overrules, which is what we want to avoid, to have the power and the opportunity of a free network. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Let's get some comments and questions. Jimmy, you want to start? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, you said that uh, you think that making uh, the request public knowledge uh, should not be done, but that the uh, website uh, or the issue or the information should be notified. But those seem very much in tension uh, with each other. So for example, whenever we at Wikipedia receive a notice from Google, um, we publish the notice immediately. Um, how do you propose to deal with that sort of situation? The issuer should not make public, uh, you, you as issuer should be notified that there is a decision to cancel that specific information for, from whatever authorities. But you, as the issuer of the information, should not make public that that has been requested. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, we do make that public and we'll continue to do so. Are you proposing that we should be legally forbidden from doing so? If the authority has come to the conclusion that there is a right of an individual, that a certain information, because of the content, because of the figure, because of the relevancy of the timing, because of whatever criteria, should be eliminated, you should be notified. That's my question. Uh, David, you had a, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had a, a quick question, Mr. Catania. Um, we've heard several times around uh, from several panelists about uh, whether or not Google should be, you know, the, the, the entity that makes these decisions. We interpret the, the actual decision to require us uh, to make those uh, decisions, uh, although that's, of course, not the, old, the final decision is not Google's. Any of these things can be appealed uh, to uh, official institutions, as you put it. Uh, is, you, is it your view that, uh, or would it be your view that, or, or would you give advice to Google uh, to uh, defer on making decisions on these uh, questions and, and have them uh, sort of reject them all so then they, an official institution should, should look at them? No, I don't think you should either defer or refuse to do a duty which has been ruled by the Supreme Court. But even time, I should suggest a company like Google and all the others, uh, uh, search engine organization to move through the official uh, official channels to make sure that this decision should be revised. Okay, I see. L Luciano, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I'm probably uh, asking almost the same question again and again. So I'm not sure we're getting a straight answer here. Uh, it's always um, uh, problematic when, uh, when a philosopher invites to um, realism. Uh, oh, let me see if I got your point right. You are saying, you're suggesting, and I think that probably applies to uh, uh, Montalero as well, um, that we should um, perhaps institute or identify a so-called independent institution to which um, to put in charge of a decision about every single request that is sent from now on in the future, including the 100,000 requests that have been uh, already uh, sent and the other uh, million that will arrive and in a timely manner deal with this? Is that, is that the suggestion? Uh, how to deal with the transition phase, honestly? No, no, I forget about the transition. Right. The question is, the final, the final can I repeat the answer just in case you misunderstood? I'm not talking about the transition. The, an the question is, are you envisaging a point when an independent institution will decide about whether the link should or should not be removed? Each link, each request, one by one. Yes. Thank you. And that was a very clear answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Sabine. <laughs> we are talking here. We are talking here of a general uh, interest. Yes. Thank you. Are you in favor of a European regulation 
uh, for uh, search engines uh, or to um, implement uh, the ruling and to find the right provisions uh, in, for example, a data protection ruling or something like that? You are touching a very sensitive field, as you know. My answer, of course, would be yes. All these matters we are discussing, with, which has to do with the network, with the net, with the internet, with data protection, with privacy, in my view, cannot be managed in the future country by country, but you should have an European integrated view. Just Jose very briefly, as representative of the companies, do you think that it's necessary for the companies from a global point of view to have an international instrument to have very real, clear rules on privacy for all the world and not only an, a specific a partial rules or regulations in Europe, the States, Latin America, etc., etc. So it's, it's necessary to have an international instrument, binding international instrument on privacy. It's another very di yeah. difficult question in a global economy where, where everything is integrated. Uh, of course, the final goal should be that way. I would be, I tell you, I would be happy if we have at least at European stage uh, a first step of that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other quick interventions? I think that's that is. Uh, thank you very much and and uh, for your comments. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Oreste Pulicino. Um, professor Polichino is an associate professor at the Department of Law at, in is it Bocconi University in Milan, where he gained his PhD in constitutional law. His research areas are in European competitive constitutional law, media law, and internet law. He's an editor of the Internal International Journal of Communications Law and Policy, as well as the editorial committee member of the Observatory of European and Comparative Private Law on Conformity to Fundamental Laws in Europe. He's also the founder and managing director of two Italian websites and has authored numerous essays in this area. Professor? Many thanks. Before starting, just um, a general statement. And in a way, it's going against my own view of constitutional law. It's quite attracting at attempting the narrative of fundamental rights but uh, it's also really, really tricky because uh, we just, uh, it's, it, the rhetoric of fundamental rights, the fundamental, fundamental rights-based argument, it's in a way hiding another problem, the problem of incentive of foreign corporation to invest in Europe and to the, uh, the importance of create a really European unified market of digital information. So, in a way, it's something that I say also regarding my attitude to elaborate just on the fundamental rights based. Very tempting, very sexy, but sometimes a little bit unproductive. So let's go to the unproductive because I will, I will as, you, as you can imagine, as a constitutional lawyer, I will base my speech on, on the constitutional law and fundamental rights. Saying something that has already been said many times and I will say another time. The famous balance between, uh, uh, I don't know, Luciano likes very much this word, uh, the, fam the famous balance between freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, my view is quite simple and banal. Um, the European Court of Justice in this, uh, in this uh, decision gave a kind of, let's say, disproportionate prevalence to the digital right to privacy uh, and in a way overlooked the, the protection of freedom of expression. I will say this, on I will add a, a textual argument of this analysis. The Article 11 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights has never, never been quoted in the reasoning, never been explicitly quoted. Where, uh, where, whereas Article 7 and 8 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, have been quoted several, several times, even granting, uh, this is something familiar to the European law lawyers, a direct effect horizontal direct effect. This is uh, it's what I tried to elaborate in a paper that I hope you will not be boring for you to read. Having said this, what is very paradoxical in this judgment? That a fundamental rights-based reasoning is lacking in something that is crucial for every legal order based on the rule of law, like should be the European Union. 
that every time that there is a restriction of fundamental right should be something that in Italian, in Italy we called in the constitutional law, riserva di giurisdizione, riserva jurisdiction, should be a judicial authority to assess the legitimacy of restriction. In this case, the first word that could become even the last one, this is the, po the point, the first word that could be the last one, it's on the shoulder of a private actor. That is not outside the game, but it's clearly part of the game. So this is a kind of paradox. Having said this, which could be the next, the next question? In the shift from the world of atoms to the world of bit, using the very famous expression of Nicolas Negroponte, being digital 95, in the shift from the world of atoms to the world of bit, has in a way changed the, the level, the degree of judicial protection to the freedom, of, to the freedom expression granted by courts in the world? Very difficult question to answer in six minutes and 13 seconds. But maybe it would be interesting to do an attempt by focusing the first two minutes, the first one minute and a half on the First Amendment and the judicial interpretation of the court of the Supreme Court, and the, the, in, the, in the last, in the, in the in the next minutes, focusing on the European courts. Everybody knows the holy nature of, holy, of the First Amendment. And uh, the, the, the question is, has in a way changed the judicial interpretation of the Supreme Courts when the protection of fundamental rights is not anymore enjoyed in a material world, but in a digital one? The answer is not. On the contrary, the Supreme Courts amplified the nature of, uh, um, the nature of, of freedom expression when there the, the, the was a shift from the world of atoms to the world of bits. Just a, a simple example, uh, Reno, 97. The, court, the Supreme Court in that case saw the great implication in terms of freedom of the most precious way of communication in the world. So, moving from the world of atoms to the world of bits, there is a further announcement of the already huge protection of First Amendment. What's about Europe? Which is the trend of Europe? I already mentioned the asymmetric balancing of Google Spain, so I will not say anything more on that, just saying that this is a confirmation of a, of a less of a lower degree of, of, of protection of freedom of expression that is confirmed by a previous case in, com in completely other fields. I'm speaking about Sabam versus Scarlett. It's related to copyright. But there also, in another sense, you have a rhetoric in which there is a step further of economic freedom and a step back of the narrative of freedom of expression. But now I think it's very important, this is a big absent in this debate today, to move to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Because it would be really partial today to speak about the European constitutionalism in terms of freedom of expression just by focusing on the European Court of Justice. There are many reasons for this. Just let me mention one. If you see Article 53, Paragraph 3 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, you will see that all the provision of the charter, that the same meaning of the European Convention of Human Rights should be interpreted in the same way. And Article 7 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights is exactly the same um, text of Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So, the European Convention of Human Rights and the speech of the European, in Article 10, in a way, encapsulated the, the European constitutionalism view on freedom of expression. It's not holy, it's not absolute, but there are limitations. Article 10, first paragraph test, states the freedom. Article uh, 10, paragraph 2, states the limitation. Even in the light of this much more restricted view, what is very interested, interesting is that the European Court of Human Rights, in the analog words, try to stretch as much as possible the potential of freedom, freedom of expression. Just saying that is the watchdog of illegal order is one of the most precious rights in our Bill of Rights. So in a way, even rowing, even if there was a, a textual provision that was rowing against, 
at least in relation to First Amendment, that Strasbourg Court did what the possible, I would say even the impossible, to stretch all the limits. Now, the, the last question is, uh, it has in a way changed the attitude of Strasbourg Court when the play field, the field of the game, moved from the atoms to the bits? The answer is yes, something changed. If you look at the, 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 um, the case law of the last two years in the European Court of Human Rights re in relation to the freedom of expression in the internet, you will find something very strange. You will see that the European Court of Human Rights has the attitude to justify restriction of freedom of expression in the contracted state that will never allowed in analog words. The answer, the question is why? I have not, I have not clear an answer, but I can, it's just an attempt. If you, I mean, Delphi case is just one case. It's not, by the way, if you know, final, but it's just the last confirmation of this trend. I, will, I can enumerate then in a paper all the, all the decision. But the real question is why? If you look through the reasoning of the Strasbourg court, you will find something quite interesting. You will see that the Strasbourg judges are worried about the lack of control of states with regard to this new, it's not so new, medium, medium in relation to the old media where the court, where the states had a kind of much more strong control. The, the comparison is clearly with regard to print, broadcasting, and internet. Since on the internet, the, 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 power, the states have not this kind of control, then there is the shift of the need to control from a domestic dimension to the supranational one. And then the courts leaves much less margin of appreciation to the states and take on, uh, on uh, its own shoulder the task to control, which could be the contrasting rights to freedom of expression in order to get a right balancing. Now, the answer, the question is, is this the right approach? I don't know, but I think it, it was interesting to contextualize the Google Spain reasoning in a much wider context. Many thanks. Thank, thank you, Professor Policino. Do we have comments from our panel? Luciana? Luciana will yield the floor to someone else. Luciana, would you like to go first? Thank you. Um, since you mentioned the uh, magic word balance at the beginning, uh, which together with the, the word uh, complex seems to be determining the whole semantics of, of this debate. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you, which may help us to uh, clarify the debate uh, for our task. Now, the word balance uh, puts everybody uh, on, on, on the same foot and makes everybody happy. It is so ambiguous that uh, every, each of us then interprets that word one way or the other. Uh, so let me give you uh, three different ways in which we can find a balance, and I'd like to understand uh, whether we stand in one, the other, or the third. Balance uh, before um, us could be, I want to go to an Italian restaurant, you want to go to a French restaurant. The balance is, we go to a Spanish restaurant. Yeah. Balance number two, I like Italian, like French. One weekend Italian, the other weekend French. Alternatively, there is no Spanish food. Balance number three, we go to a restaurant which serves both Italian and French food. Everybody happy. Now these are three different policies about going out for food. No? When we speak about balance, what do you have in mind? Alternate between rights? Mix the right into a, a third right that combines the two? Or find a different right altogether that would put the two in some kind of harmony? Thanks. I, um, I would, would answer with the... Um, with the visions of uh, balancing the, the European Court of Human Rights or the Italian Constitutional Courts. Right, well, balancing, it means enforcing a principle of proportionality and uh, uh, understanding that there are two rights that have a constitutional rank, so there could not be a radical defeat of one in relation to the other one, but it should be applied a, a proportional principle, in particular a self-restrictive, less restrictive alternative test. In this case, I think that the court didn't enforce the right less restrictive alternative test. 
<laughs> let's, let's go to Spanish. I understand perfectly well when, when people talk about balance between the exercise of different rights, and, and I think it's the right term, but it can actually be misconstrued. Um, when we go back to the definitions of human rights, that they're all equal and all complementary and all interdependent and interrelated, it may be that, that there could be other terms, and I insist not the balance is wrong or anything like that, but the idea is to have a complementary interpretation. Because one of the issues that has worries me in all this discussion is that, yes, in this resolution, there is excessive weight given to privacy in an independent way to the detriment of freedom of expression, but that's not to say that privacy is not important. And I have a report where I say that privacy is very relevant to exercise freedom of expression because the breach of privacy is what's generating intimidation and a chilling effect, which is one of the issues we're confronting in the world. So in a way, there's complementarity in the exercise of, of rights. And the focus could be how to create a positive complementarity and not the detriment which would seem to come out of this decision of the court. You know? Interesting point, just a small mm -hmm. uh, uh, remark. I think that here, one of the crucial point is that this decision, it's a reactive one. So if we focus on what was before and why that was this decision, maybe we can understand why this radical approach. But and we know exactly what happens and which kind of scandals. But being a reactive one, the point is, can we really build everything in relation to internet governance today on judicial globalization, on the, on the power of judges to create norms in the lack of political powers? Because at the end, it's a question also of legitimacy, of who is putting the rules. You had a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Policine. Uh, I hope my question is not too legally uh, technical, but can you really blame the Court of Justice for not taking into account, for not referring to Article 10, freedom of expression, if that argument was not put forward in the case? Strictly speaking, this was a case between Mr. Costeja and Google. And if I read the ruling correctly, the balance was made between the individual right to privacy, right to reputation on the one hand, and the commercial interest of Google on the other hand, and a kind of collective interest of the public in having access to certain information, but there was no balance between an individual's right to express him or herself and an individual's right to privacy. Is that correct? Is it also how you see it? I. I, I understand what, what you mean, but um, I think that the, 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 the counter the let's say the, the drawback of the, the right to be forgotten in this case was clearly the need to access some information that could be relevant. If there is a need to access to information, information that could be relevant, then there is clearly an expression of freedom of expression. And th I say this just, just not because it's my impression, but be because if you read the, the conclusion of Advocate General Yaskinen in the case, it's the same case, the same questions, but Yaskinen is making many, many reference to Article 11 of the European Charter. So some, somebody is missing the point. I don't know who, I have some suspicions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Professor. Um, we have the honor of our last expert uh, to talk to us. It's uh, Professor Vincenzo. Is it Zeno Zenakovic? Did I get that right? No, I did, I did it wrong. I apologize. Um, the professor teaches comparative law here in Roma. And he's also rector of Rome University for International Studies and co-editor of the legal periodical Il Diritto dell'Informazione in the legal periodical Il Dorito and Del Informatica, if I get that right. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. I wish to thank Google for allowing me to present my usually non-conventional views. Uh, I will be, try to be rather brief and then leave some time for the questions. Uh, 
I have eight points. Uh, the ECJ decision, as many decisions of Supreme Courts on this side, on the other side of the Atlantic, is a political decision. And this decision asserts EU sovereignty on the internet when it concerns EU citizens, contrasting the claim of US sovereignty by the US government and US companies. So it is a question of sovereignty, and questions of sovereignty can be decided only by diplomacy and international agreements. It is not only one decision by a court which can solve the, the issue. Uh, may I add also that it seems to me, personally having studied this all, most of my, all my academic life, uh, a wrong approach to frame the issue which we're discussing here with the first, what I would call the First Amendment approach. In Europe, we are far from convinced that everything on the internet is and should be protected. And we feel, this is the general opinion in Europe and in its tradition, that the internet is like any other physical place in the world and therefore it has its inevitable share of gossip, garbage, falsehood and vilification. And may I also add that the ECJ decision is only in part uh, about the right to be forgotten. I mean, here we are discussing about this, but I think this is in the decision, the case is a case of the right to be forgotten, but the, uh, the general implication of the decision is much wider. And I think that to put it only under this idea of the right to be forgotten is rather simplistic. It has to do with what uh, in Germany is called informational self-determination or according to an Italian notion, uh, the right to one's identity. So the removal of search results is only one of the ways through which this right informational self-determination or right to one's identity can be protected. I will uh, focus on one specific aspect. I think one has to distinguish. One cannot find one solution for all the different cases one is presented. I will focus on one typical case which presents ourselves, at least I find it in my legal practice, I find it every day, and is extremely common, and I don't think it's only because I specialize in this field. And uh, one of the most uh, common aspect uh, case is that of news concerning a criminal investigation which subsequently is closed or the accused person is acquitted. So the original news is true, there is a criminal investigation, but subsequently that news becomes false because there has been the... Uh, uh, person who was accused has been cleared, he has been acquitted. So in this case, and only relating to this case, I'm talking about this, not of all the other different cases, I would like to try to answer to the very stimulating uh, questionnaire that was uh, circulated. Position of the requester. I don't think that this is substantial. As a matter of fact, one could say that the higher the position, the more the interest that one's uh, legal affairs be, uh, uh, be cleared. Content. I think that information about judicial proceedings must, I underline, must be correct, complete, and updated. Otherwise, the cornerstone of the rule of law, which is controlled by the courts, is turned into a form of digital lynching. We're talking about we just throw things on the internet and we're not interested if then the, everything has been changed. We just throw this on and then we'll, we let these news, this news survive, whatever decision the courts. What the courts decide is irrelevant. The only thing is that the person has been accused. And in that moment, one that day, that person has been accused. Not that he has been acquitted. Recency, the information, we're talking about this kind of information, should be corrected and updated as soon as possible so there's no question of recency. Source, I would distinguish among the sources. Experience tells us that the most serious damage is brought generally by unprofessional and unethical dissemination of information often shrouded behind anonymity. This is a very significant uh, problem. When the source instead comes from an information institution, I think that the removal of the link 
is, or may be, in many cases, a correct balance between competing interest. Interest to be informed and be continuously to have access to certain archives and the interest of the person of removing information that is no longer updated. Surely, I feel that the uh, publisher should be informed, and this is something that has come out, out of this uh, discussion, of the fact that the removal has been asked. And I would have, uh, uh, if I could express my personal view, not to overrule, obviously, the decision of the Grand Chambre, I think that a two-pronged action uh, would be preferable. I think that action should be, in these cases, of uh, information concerning judicial proceedings, should concern the publisher and the search action. And the lack, and uh, sorry, and the search engine. And the lack of action by the former, that is by the publisher, warrants the removal of the link by the latter, that is the search engine. The last question, which was set by, in one of the main questions set by the questionnaire. Uh, from a strictly legal point of view, one could question uh, the rule uh, that the search engine is the right entity to be deciding these requests. I would, as many of us around the table have, we, we have some doubts about that. I personally have some doubts. But from a legal realistic perspective, uh, Power entails responsibility, and somehow this kind of solution, I would just like to point out, that is clearly envisaged by the e-commerce directive, although put in a different uh, context, but it is clearly established there. So at any rate, I think that this uh, empowering of a private entity should be an adjudication of last resort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, maybe we have some comments or questions from the panel. Who would like to start? Go ahead. Jose Luis. <coughs> sí. Questo è un problema del come dice il detto del rapporto tra il website e il motore di ricerca. L'informazione deve essere accurata, attuale, eccetera, eccetera. E stiamo parlando del diritto al We are talking about uh, the right to be forgotten. Now, do you think that since when an information, a piece of information has been erased from a search engine, and if that piece of information still is on the internet, still is available on the internet, the aware person should be present his own request to cancel data, not only with respect to in a research engine, but also in the face of uh, everyone, and especially in the face of all of the most important uh, subjects, such as Google, Yahoo, Bing, Ask, etc., etc. Because the theme, or rather the point, is not the one of erasing the piece of data from one engine, but rather the one of avoiding the knowledge of that information. So there seems to be a contradiction. Everyone has to submit the request only to Google. Millions of requests only to Google. But then what's going to happen? Shouldn't there be an obligation? And then is there not a contradiction in the fact of just submitting the request to one single search engine. I'm paid by Google, but I've never gone on a different, every now and then I, by accident, I end up on a different <laughs> search engine and I, I regret it, uh, <laughs> if I may say so, and quite correctly, you just say competition, just competition is a click away, and I see, and I stay. Just, just repeat all that once I, again, I sir. I stay well, <laughs> well away from that click, and I get furious when I say, you want this research search engine to be the, your favorite? I say, no, I do not. I want Google. So I'm, uh, but I think, obviously, you should, you should request it. If, if I do not, do not have data on how much, well, I, yes, there is data, but I think that we are talking about a very very small part of the market is on those. I think, obviously, you would be interested to ask removal from 
also the other different uh, research engines. Although I feel that on the, in the field of uh, legal information, uh, uh, information concerning judicial affairs, I think that the request should also go to, um, uh, to the information source. Well, there's an interesting decision by the Italian, uh, not the Constitutional Court, but the highest court, the Cour de Cassation, uh, the Italian uh, Corte di Cassazione, which says that you should, when it comes to this kind of news, this news should be updated. There is a duty to update. In that case, it was the Corriere della Sera, that is a reputable newspaper, Italian newspaper, and the request was that the, the news that was obsolete had to be updated. So, and this could be, uh, uh, this is also one kind of solution that could be given to the problem. Uh, you're saying that this ruling is about, is also about asserting European sovereignty. But what do you make of the fact that even if this ruling is enforced um, and uh, links are being taken down, you can still uh, go and find it on other part of Google, like, you know, google.com. So what, what does it make of the sovereignty? Well, you know, uh, lawyers love Latin, and we say, aducere inconvenience non est argumentum. That is, that, that if there are some inconveniences, that is not uh, a way to throw away the solution. I mean, this is obviously a partial solution. It has been said very clearly that uh, one needs global solutions. And uh, uh, my distinguished uh, colleague, Elio Catania, said we should be satisfied if we find a European uh, solution. Uh, I think that this decision should favor at least a transatlantic dialogue on how to solve these issues. If there's no dialogue between uh, the US and the European Union, I doubt we can get to an, uh, something that is satisfactory for Europe, Europe and also for the, uh, the US. But I, I don't think that this is impossible. One, goes, one starts finding the European solution. I mean, the Brazil, take the solution of the uh, Marco Civil uh, uh, in, in Brazil, and which is a solution which I would expect, I'm no, but um, Oreste Policino is an expert in this field, uh, uh, probably will extend to most of Latin America. So, I mean, you see we are joining, and Canada is already a, a country which is very near to European to the European approach. So I think we could sort of create an area in which there is somehow uh, we are getting together an important part of the world. Now, Peggy, you have a question, and then Luciano, you'll get the, the final and very quick question. But Peggy, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Zenozenkovic. I get the impression from your intervention that you do consider search engines as intermediaries and not as service providers who have their own liability, as I believe the court has said, the harm here results not from the fact that information was published, but from the fact that it's aggregated in a certain way in search results for someone's name. Did I interpret your intervention correctly? Um, I think there should be uh, different degrees of liability. I don't think that the only way of uh, envisaging liability is how it is framed in the, in the directive, in the privacy directive of 1995. I think that is of civil liability, tortious liability. One can imagine various forms of responsibility, let's put it in this terms, not of liability, of responsibility, and what you should do to avoid further damage. I think this is graduation of remedies is very important. We do not, I don't think one can have only, you know, the damage solution. There's a tort, there's damage. No, you can have various ways of repairing, uh, what the damage can be done. And I think, and at least my personal experience, clients come to me not for money, but for reputation, they want their reputation somehow cleared. And no money is going to pay their reputation back. They want, the, in reputational markets, we need to remove bad in, information which is incorrect and damages reputation, and we do not need money for that. We need something that is uh, you know, specific uh, remedies. We do not need monetary remedies, damage remedies. 
Luciano, why don't you have the last quick question for Gallus? Um, just a um, uh, very interesting uh, point you made about, um, well, basically, uh, you, you stress quite um, uh, extensively the importance of truthfulness of information in question. Uh, you spoke about uh, the information being complete, correct, uh, up to date. Um, the, the Court of Justice uh, was actually talking about the relevance of the information. Uh, I just wonder whether you had a comment on when the information in question is complete, is correct, is up to date, as in it's a fact, historical fact, end of the story. There's nothing you can update about that. Uh, and yet the decision is sorry, you had to remove the link. Um, I, I know we, we can agree to disagree. Uh, your idea is that once you, are, uh, you have done something that is wrong for the rest of the life, there's, uh, I've written an article on how we shifted from the Latin notion of damnatio memoria. When you were bad, your, the emperor was bad and was removed, he was killed, all his emblems were removed. Here we have memoria damnata, the opposite. Your memory is damned. You're going to be remembered for the centuries for what you've done. And Mr. Costea is going to be remembered, should be remembered for centuries, because he has not paid taxes or welfare taxes. And for the rest, I am not of that idea. I think that in contemporary societies, naming is shaming. And this is very important in reputational markets. But does the, is this limited? Is the, I mean, we have re removed, at least in Italy, life sentences. I mean, is the shaming, uh, is it a life sentence? Or is the, as has been pointed out before, there's somehow a way of, we're not going to remove the fact that Mr. Costea did not pay, we do not know why, I do not know why, his, uh, welfare sums and therefore is, he was subject to some kind of procedure, civil procedure, and say, well, let's forget about that. I mean, the, what happened, happened. Let's remove that. If you go on La Vanguardia, you will find that news if you want to go and look for it on Mr. Costea, but we're not going to have everybody around the world know that. I think that it is perfect. His request is perfectly legitimate, and I think that well, they generally, Americans say hard cases may, ba may make bad law. And in this case, I don't know, it was, surely was a hard case, but I don't know if it was bad law. I think you agree that we disagree. And on that note, um, why don't we take a minute. Uh, let's first take a minute and, and thank our experts here. So thank you guys very much. We're going to um, now move to what I hope will be the highlight of this entire thing, which is your questions. And we have five or six questions, um, and if it's okay, we'll just go straight into that. Some of the questions are more specific to either an expert or a panelist, um, and some of them are in general. So let me just, and, and uh, since people have given our names, I'll go ahead and name them if that's okay. This is a question from Vera Colella, Colella uh, and this is a question to everybody. Um, as a partial solution, shouldn't Google stop the indexing of archives of newspapers? So the archives of newspapers, so that news articles can only be accessed via the archives themselves. So the question was, I'll repeat, this is to, from one of the audience members to anyone here. Uh, shouldn't Google stop indexing the archives of newspapers, referring to the historic newspapers, so that the news articles can only be accessed to the archives themselves? Jimmy. Well, I mean, the, this would be very, very bad for the people who are, for example, trying to write Wikipedia, also for journalists. Uh, one of the most useful tools is to go into the Google News Archives um, and search for some topic, and then you have a collection. If you had to go to each individual website, uh, you wouldn't even know which ones to go to in many cases to find an obscure news article, uh, something like that. So. That kind of wholesale cutting off of information doesn't seem to be a very fruitful approach uh, to solving what actually end up being fairly rare problems, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with respect to news archives. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it seems like that would just sort of be a blanket uh, application of the right to, to be forgotten. Uh, and I think it's probably better for the world to do it, on a, do it more narrowly. OK. Our next question is to you, David. Ah, uh, it's from Giuseppe, my mic <laughs> Giuseppe Ch uh, Citarella. Will the European Court of Justice decision and the subsequent requests influence Google's filtering of information? Well, 
to the extent the question is, well, are we doing anything as a result of the ruling? The answer is yes. Um, and of course, we've uh, we're, we have this process to help uh, help guide us uh, in that respect. But in terms of more more generally, you, you know, we have uh, since the beginnings of Google uh, always had uh, a set of strong principles around expression and, and the fact that our the search engine was about access to information, uh, and we wanted that to that to be uh, the access that access to be as broad as as possible, uh, while at the same time, you know, uh, uh, complying with local laws. Uh, there are some local laws we don't want to comply with, and we don't put people in those countries because we, we simply don't want to. Uh, but um, and and always doing uh, complying with local laws uh, locally, we will continue this approach. Um, you know, the we you know obviously it was, it's it's not. Uh, it's obvious that uh, we litigated the, this case. We had a different point of view during the litigation, uh, but that's finished. Uh, and so, with respect to the right to be uh, the, the court of justice ruling, we're we're going to comply with that. But I don't think that will uh, affect uh, the other things that we do uh, around uh, removals and, uh, and making sure that uh, Google continues to be uh, this tool for for expression. You know, my answer is that. Uh, it's very important that we respect the, de the decision which is final from the European Court of Justice, but it would have been helpful if it were a little clearer on some of the details. And I think the reason we're having, we asked our panel basically to do this, is frankly we need some help on these decisions. Um, we didn't ask to be appointed the decision maker. We were ordered to be the decision maker. And I have publicly said that I didn't particularly like that order, but nevertheless, it's the law. David says we follow the law. It's the law. We're following the law. Um, our next question is uh, Giuseppe Mastrodonato. Um, and this is to everyone, but in particular, the journalists. And we've got a number of journalists here um, who can answer this question. Defamation. Does the concept of free expression still apply if we're talking about people who defame others? So for, he's used this as an example, black hat SEO practitioners. To repeat the question, does the concept of free expression still apply if we're talking about people who defame others? Let's have a journalist. So, go ahead. I have an easy answer for, to this because in France we have very strict laws about defamation and libel and we have to comply, uh, otherwise we are taken to court, and that is actually something that we uh, find uh, most of the time quite difficult to uh, deal with because it restricts our, our work, but that's the law in France, so we have to respect it. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, um, two years ago, the four rapporteurs on freedom of expression, the three regional rapporteurs, Africa, Europe, and Latin America and the Americas and myself from the UN, we made a joint statement talking about the need to decriminalize defamation. Um, we believe it is important to have defamation, but this is important to mention because it shows the nuances. Defamation is important to have uh, as a civil action to correct uh, wrong statements or to correct some form of harm uh, or to ask uh, the judge order for a public apology or for a, a public correction but not through criminal law, because through criminal law it has become basically a, an element of intimidation around the world and it has the so-called chilling effect. So the, the sole existence of defamation as criminal law was seen as a limitation on freedom of expression. This is why we believe it was very important, but this, it's also interesting that it was a uniform position of all regional bodies regarding uh, freedom of expression. Any other comments from the journalists? Go ahead, uh, Professor uh, Riotto. The, um, again, uh, new, new media, new media, all, all values. Uh, I, I love Professor uh, Zeno Zenkovic, and I promise Mr. Schmidt is a difficult name for Italians as well to pronounce. Uh, uh, but when you mention um, uh, information becomes false if somebody is accused of something and then is acquitted. Well, it becomes false depending on how you cover the trial because if you say it has been accused and then is not, uh, is acquitted, is not false. It becomes false and we know in Italy how many newspapers that if you are accused, then you're guilty. Then is the, 
the reckless malice, the, the, the American uh, jurist would say. So uh, I've suffered, Mr. Schmidt, the, the web on two sides. I've been uh, uh, on trial as a journalist, and I've been on trial as a person that has been uh, uh, defamed uh, as a public figure. So uh, I, I don't take issue. My, my son says, uh, you're quite controversial on Google Dad. And uh, I like that being controversial on Google Dad. And he, again, as uh, Sylvie said, it's, it, it, it's how you cover uh, events. If you are in good faith and you have access to information and you don't have any uh, kind of intent of uh, defaming people, uh, w w whatever course the event takes, you will always be fair. If you enter the field with uh, malicious uh, intents, then eventually you'll be uh, libeling somebody. Let's move to our, our next question. This is from, uh, this is actually to Professor Floridi. So listen up. This is from Benedetto Ponti. Um, Italian legislation requires that certain personal data of public officials are published and indexed for transparency purposes, and that filter mechanisms like robots.txt may not be applied. They cannot be filtered. In these cases, the public interest in full knowability is enshrined in law. How should Google decide in these cases? Should it be case by case, or as indicated by Italian law? Is this a question for me, Eric? It's, really? Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> it's, uh, for, it was uh, directed to Professor Florida. Um, uh, I'm sure you can, uh, you can talk about what Google should or should not do way better than, than I can. Uh, what should we do ethically, independently, or whatever Google uh, we want to do, is that, um, um, forgive me, this uh, sounds again uh, from the other side of the channel. Transparency, uh, a good dose of transparency is welcome as in uh, how much uh, you earn uh, and uh, if you are a public official. Uh, what's your salary? Good idea. Exactly what is your salary? I mean, it would be open door in, in, in other no, Scandinavian countries. Um, so um, generally speaking, I, I don't think that uh, we should um, start thinking in terms of oh, how much information we should be blocking um, by default and uh, let's whatever we do not block uh, uh, allow um, on the web. So if the uh, general answer uh, can go, instead of uh, ask, no, uh, answering for Google, uh, I will say, yes, of course, uh, the more the better. Okay, thank you. I, I would just add that I, I think uh, Mr. Catania pointed out this contradiction uh, in, his, in his remarks. Uh, I, you know, it, it's an interesting case. I think if we have something that's, we have two conflicting laws, we'll have to, you know, I think that that's, that's, seems like the perfect case uh, for uh, a court to resolve uh, and not us. Um, our next question is from Mario Siragusa, and this is to everyone. Um, why shouldn't Google decide on delinking? If the decision is public, subject to digital, to digital review, and editors, publishers can participate, then this is similar to what already happens in other situations in society, network access, essential facilities. So as I interpret, as I interpret the question, um, there, the, the rhetorical question is, why shouldn't Google make this decision? Somebody want to try this? Sylvie? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer this. But uh, uh, the question says, if editors and publishers participate, that's not what the court, uh, court's ruling is about. That's correct. Uh, um, and, and may I answer with another question to one of the panelists? Uh, uh, I think it's Mr. Montelero who said, uh, who talked about the skills that the media have and those skills, you know, for judging what is the right balance. Um, and that uh, Google doesn't have those skills. Search engines don't, don't have those skills. Could you, I, I would be curious to have your uh, 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 more detailed uh, assessment of what those skills have to be. Uh, my statement is based on uh, the case law. In the case law, uh, usually the action is against uh, the journalists or the newspaper. And the idea is, that what is the skill? The skill, the, the question about uh, right to be forgotten, 
is about the disclosure of facts. Not exactly about the disclosure, about the new disclosure of past events and past facts. So there are two situations. The first one, in the past, there was a public interest, uh, there was a newsworthiness of the information and was revealed. Then after five, 10, 20 years, there is a new publication of the information. And the journalists are in the position to evaluate if in that case there is an interest to reveal some new facts and also to remember the past. For instance, if a, a politician is involved in a case of corruption, but in the past he was involved in other negative situation, there is a clear interest to know his past, even if there is his past a long time from the previous facts. I, I try to simplify. There are many different nuances of this uh, uh, right to be forgotten, so please <laughs> accept that as a simplification. But this is the idea. This balance is based on the idea to know what is the public interest in terms of collecting interest, not in terms of curiosity, and the second point is uh, to, to balance the interest about information. I think that uh, journalists have an adequate professional background to do that, and they're in the best position to do that, and they do that as demonstrated by many cases, though, in the children and so on, as also at the press in, the, in, in, uh, in this field. I think that a company like Google cannot do the same because it is not in the position to have a direct knowledge of the facts. Google did not make the interview, <laughs> did not make the research about the fact, only listed the results. And there's not a that specific background that a journalist in terms of profession has. This is, I, I, I don't know, is this an adequate answer is sufficiently clear. But this is the point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move to our next question, which is from Camelia Bolan. And this is to those on the panel who support the court's decision. Which is more important, the right to privacy or the right to security? So I'll repeat that. And this is those, intended for those who support the court's decision. Which is more important, the right to privacy or the right to security? Yes, Frank. Frank, you have your mic on. Um, I'm going to be very brief. There, there is a, a report I wrote on privacy and security to the Human Rights Council in June last year. But basically, the point I make is that there is no contradiction. Real privacy is a el fundamental element of democracy. And security needs democratic systems of checks and balances. If we generate security without democracy, what we're generating is authoritarian regimes. Um, and therefore, they can violate privacy and intervene communications, and that's not the type of security we want. So um, there should be no conflict between security and, and privacy, because both privacy and security should need the reinforcement of democracy, which also needs the respect for freedom of expression. Sabine. One remark. I think uh, I have another opinion. Because we are discussing in politics always privacy on the one hand and security on the other hand. And at the end, you have to find, um, yes, you have, you have to come to the end. You have uh, to make a conclusion. And not both together. It's not possible. So at the end, it's my opinion, privacy prevails security. Yeah. May, may I have, uh, just uh, uh, to remember a quote by th Benjamin Franklin. He said that uh, those who try to choose between privacy and security deserve both of them. Preserve, uh, yes. <laughs> That's very good. Um, uh, just um, just um, uh, uh, a dissenting opinion on the poor Franklin. Uh, I think he was wrong. Uh, we should definitely uh, <laughs> choose uh, privacy above, above anything else and security only as a second choice. Um, while, while I look up the exact quote, let's... Uh, we should choose democracy. 
Uh, yes. Yeah. The, I hope the correct answer is always democracy. Um, and this is a question from someone who chose to remain anonymous. And it's a question to everyone. And this will be our final question. Shouldn't Google keep a public register of every removal request without disclosing personal information for transparency purposes? So shouldn't keep a public register, in other words, a public register that, of what was removed without the information for transparency purposes? Jimmy, you must have an opinion on this. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, I mean, I, I think that Google has, uh, for a very long time, had an admirable record of transparency about all kinds of things. They send uh, DMCA takedown notices to chilling effects and so on like this. I think in this case, from an ethical point of view, it's a little bit more of a delicate situation. And um, obviously, from a legal point of view, it's a, they, aren't, they aren't free to disclose everything. But even if we, if we move back from that, I think um, it's important that Google provide us as much information as they can in compliance with the law with an awareness that <clears throat> many of the people who are complainants aren't um, up to no good or anything. They have a genuine uh, concern, and there's no reason to name and shame people for that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, somewhere in the middle, and I, and I trust this is essentially what Google has always done and will continue to do. Did you want to say anything, David, on, on Google? Yeah, since view since of this it question? is about uh, Google yeah. and transparency, I, we actually plan to do just that, subject to you know this constraints Jimmy's talking about. And in this case, uh, you know, transparency with detail uh, obviously would undermine the, the very uh, right that uh, the court is trying to protect. Uh, but we do publish a transparency report, uh, as many of you know, and we expect that uh, the you know the aggregate numbers that we're talking about in terms of the removals we've done as a result of the court opinion um, will, will be included in that report. So um, as with everything, we like to be as transparent as we can. Are there any final comments from the experts or the panel before we wrap up? I, I want to thank, uh, oh, sorry, Frank, go ahead. No, you, two, you'll, have the, you'll have the final, final comments, so maybe, make maybe it good. And, and <laughs> literally two quick words. This came to mind when, when the discussion on privacy and security came about, but this also deals with, with privacy and freedom of expression and the balance. I, I think what we have learned in human rights in the long run is that you can't pit one right against another. Uh, we're talking about a democratic system that defends all, not by pieces and not by bits, because then you end up losing. Uh, you have to defend a democratic system where all rights are essential and all fundamental rights have to be respected. And that should be the big lesson. We cannot, in the name of one, sacrifice others because then we lose what we have so slowly in humanity gained. Thank you. That's extremely well said. Uh, and uh, Mr. Catania would like to add something. Yeah, Eric, uh, in the beginning you told us to eliminate all preambles and whatever just to be, to be more effective. Now that we are in the conclusion, let me just congratulate with the way Google is dealing with this issue. It's not an easy task. I know you've been assigned this strange work, the way you are dealing in a very transparent manner, with the support of people like your council, uh, consulting experts, I think it's a, really a tremendous proof of uh, openness and commitment. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And, and I want to thank, uh, I'm quite serious to say that it, it takes a lot of time to do this. Uh, first, our panel has dedicated, we have I think a total of seven sessions around Europe and then an innumerable number of private meetings that you all are not hearing about where these guys are going to try to sort of come back with sort of these very, very difficult uh, guidance for us. I want to thank the experts. Uh, to say that I love Italy would be an understatement because I lived here for quite some time. And um, so it's just, for me, it's just a great privilege to be here with you all. And to the audience, thank you for, for being this. We've run over a little bit, but I hope it was well worth your time. So thanks again to everybody, and we're finished for the day. Thank you. <laughs>